all of you to please be seated. We will start with the sessions and the announcements another five minutes. We are waiting for some guests. They are here any moment. They should shall be here any moment. Just give us five more minutes. We can start then. Good morning, everyone. We are happy to welcome you all for the T20 G20 workshop in hybrid mode on challenges and opportunities of sustainable energy transition being organized by Integrated Research and Action for Development. The workshop is a part of Task Force 4 Refueling Growth, Clean Energy and Green Transition side event of Think Tank as an official G20 engagement group, which serves as an idea bank for the G20 by bringing together think tanks and high-level experts to discuss relevant international socio-economic issues. T20 recommendations are synthesized into policy briefs and presented to G20 working groups, ministerial meetings, and leaders summit to help the G20 deliver concrete policy measures. Today's workshop is conceived as a platform to bring together and engage think tanks, government officials, and international experts. The workshop will discuss and deliberate on the key challenges and opportunities for sustainable energy transition and the required strategies and policies for just transition. I would like to share a brief snapshot of the workshop schedule with you all. The inaugural session is from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. Then we have a session on country experiences and sustainable energy transition from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m., followed by lunch from 1.30 p.m. to 2.15 p.m., we have a session on policy suggestions to G20 between 2.15 and 3.45 p.m. And the valedictory session shall be of 15 minutes from 3.45 p.m. to 4 p.m. So without delaying it any further, may I request all the guests to come on the dais for the inaugural session. I would like to invite Mr. Tarun Kapoor, advisor to PM, PMO, Office Government of India. See here. Is not coming. So we, we'll just wait for five, 10 minutes and then we can start with the inaugural session. And the guests and the dignitaries who are there with us virtually, please check that they are available with us. Anshuman.
Hey, 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 check, check. So without delaying it any further, let's start with our inaugural session. I would like to invite Mr. Tarun Kapoor, advisor to PM, PMO Office, Government of India on the dais. Please welcome with a round of applause. Next, we have Mr. August Tano, Country Director, of World Bank India. So please welcome. <clears throat> Professor Jyoti Parik, Executive Director, Irade. Ma'am, please come on the dais. <clears throat> Dr. Kirit Parik, Chairman, Irade. So please come on the dais and take your seats. Dr. Jeffrey D. Sachs, Director, Center for Sustainable Development, Earth Institute, Columbia University, is here with us virtually. Now request Professor Jyoti Parikh to please conduct the session. And watch. Uh, we have, uh, I'm sorry to say that the mini, uh, Honorable Minister for Power could not come. He has regretted only last night at, at 10 o'clock. And uh, so we would have to continue without him. Can we, uh, we have a little problem of the time. Uh, Jeff, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University says he has, he has to be there at 20, 10.20. Anyway, then let me just, I can stay till 12. Huh? I can stay till 12. you can stay till 12. I'm mean, that's good to know. So uh, then I will start.
Sri Tarun Kapoor, advisor to the Prime Minister uh, in the Prime Minister's office, Mr. August De Kaum, the country director, World Bank, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Columbia University, Dr. Kirit Parikh, Chairman Irade, uh, uh, Honorable Embassy and High Commission representatives from many G20 countries here in the audience, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and also nearly 300 people who have joined us virtually. Welcome to all. On behalf of Irade and myself, I welcome you and thank you also uh, to the uh, through this T20 workshop for G20 on the 75th anniversary of India's independence. And also it is in Irade Integrated Research and Action for Development. It's our 20th anniversary and we are gathered here to discuss sustainable energy transition. Now that's a word, everyday word nowadays, it's, uh, climate change, renewable energy, it's transition. But it is worthwhile to remember that it is neither the first energy transition nor would it be the last. In the 19th century, the first energy transition took us from fuel wood and solid biomass to the first solid fuel coal. Together with steam engines and turbines, coal captured the power and railway sector. In the 20th century came the liquid and gaseous fuels, oil and gas, again, together with internal combustion uh, engines and other innovations, they capture the power industries, transport services, and many other sectors. They occupied almost two thirds of the total energy by the mid seventies. They rule till today, replacing coal in several sectors such as railways and power. Yes, there is a state fast, uh, uh, there is a state fast support from the head hydropower but only where and when suitable locations and water are available. In between came high hopes from nuclear power, liquid biofuels and so on. However, they could not capture the, a large share as expected at the global level. They do continue to play an important role for some countries. All, all through this period, energy efficiency had increased and continues to do so. In the 21st century, we have pinned our hopes on the unlimited nature-based energy sources, solar, wind, hydro, uh, biomass, etc., We hope to switch from depending on stocks of energy to natural flows of energy. They are guaranteed to be there for decades and centuries with no price attached and more equitably available to most countries. Along with this transition, the demand side would have to also shift as we have seen that as uh, with every energy source, new innovations have to come on the demand side as well. And we have to shift to electric vehicles, electric cooking, large industries would have to change and so on. However, we already realize their limitations. They are intermittent, their availability is unpredictable, their paucity of rare materials that go into harnessing them. And there is also environmental impact on birds environment, and all these are not yet fully understood. Moreover, due to climate change, their unpredictability will be even more. Their viability on a large scale is yet to be assessed. It is already clear that small and large scale storage solutions will be necessary. Even the impact of large scale fossil fuels was obvious only seven, eight decades later. One after another, every technology obvious only uh, whether it, when it acquires certain scale, whether fossil or renewables. So, and nuclear, now we have to be ready with more technologies and uh, we are looking at new solutions, nuclear, hydrogen, fusion, uh, and satellite based uh, so, uh, power and so on. So these are all resource related, technological, but they are also huge societal and environmental challenges and impacts and society has to struggle along. Thus energy transition has been a perpetual struggle. Transition is the only constant here. However, what lasted more than a century earlier may take five to eight decades and may soon be even less. We are therefore keeping all our options open uh, uh, on the uh, and for new, new technology in the horizon. 
we need to recognize the importance of the uh, lifestyle related changes and energy efficiency or megawatts, which may be based on not only technology, but lifestyles, collective cooperative solutions. They are needed at the personal, personal social, societal, national and global level. All of us have to look into how we use energy, how society uses energy, how our countries use energy. Though currently we must focus on energy related issues of the transition from the fossil fuel today. We need to think also the entire supply chains involving oil wells, oil ships, ports, refineries, pipelines, tankers. Uh, and uh, when you come to coal, it's coal mines, coal transport, coal power, gas supply chain, and so on. There is so much revenue here. Taxes, investments, incomes from these three sources is a huge part of our economy. So uh, we are talking about massive economic transitions about which we have not yet even begun to uh, grapple. For example, uh, Indian railways move 700 million tons of coal and the freight revenues with their heavy taxes help subsidize passenger transport. So how will we do that? We need to look at the entire supply chain from exploration of fossil fuels to mining, processing, transporting, and finally disposal. Moreover, they concern the, uh, uh, let's say talk about uh, the end uses, the boilers, turbines, diesel uh, vehicles, oil rig business, less railway wagons, less tracks, less everything that we are using now uh, and it's, uh, and its production, uh, they all have to have think about what to do next. That means we could go on down to less iron, steel, cement, construction, etc. Thus, financial, economic, and social issues would be enormous. But we, we have a one possibility that renewables have low gestation period and they have uh, they, they are modular, so easy to uh, uh, even dismantle and take somewhere else. To sum up, such an upheaval requires that we, the G20 countries, join hands together and find cooperative solutions, not only for us, but also for others. Out of 20 G20 countries, seven are countries from G77, which are developing countries. There are Still many persons witnessing only the first kind of transition that is clean fuels for cooking. Nearly 2.3 billion have not even enjoyed kind of uh, lifestyle we have, and they've not even enjoyed LPG. On the other hand, with the rest of the society in these very countries elsewhere are looking to leapfrog to the second transition. Uh, emerging economies will need technology, finance, and capacity building, and they are rightly raising equity issues, pointing out that they have not only their low per capita energy consumption, but low share in cumulated emissions that are historically accumulated. <laughs> the need for finance technology and capacity building is enormous. Despite the equity concerns, there is a general consensus in all countries that the tra transition is needed, definitely needed, and due to national and, uh, and pose national and global risks. In fact, India, China, and EU countries have agreed to the net zero emission goal for varying years from 2040 to 2070. India has promised to reach non-fossil power capacity share to 50% by 2030. These are substantive, measurable, and verifiable NDC targets. Such a decarbonization goal in the early stages of development will ensure much less cumulated emissions from India's future pathways, from em though emission growth in the very near future is unavoidable. As even bigger promise of meeting SDG to its own people has to still be done first. Today, a rich diversity of speakers are with us. Uh, they are from highly, uh, they are highly experienced people from all walks of energy sectors, who have been pushing the transition boundaries. They include government representatives, think tanks, and universities, international bodies like World Bank, United Nations, IRENA, and others. 
participation of nearly uh, 100 in the audience and several hundred who joined virtually. Welcome again, and thank you very much for being here. Now, can we request uh, Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University to come on the screen, please? Thank you. Greetings, uh, can you uh, see me? Hello? Yes, Mr. Sachs, we can see you. Great, uh, shall I begin then? Uh, yes, please. Great, well, thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure and honor to be with this G20, T20, Irati, a great uh, forum. Pleasure honor to be with this G20, T20, Irati, a great forum, honor to be with. And if I could ask you to turn your microphone off, then I won't get an echo and you won't hear an echo. So thank you very much for uh, the Good chance to uh, share a few words you with you. So thank you. Uh, I'm in Athens today, as you can see uh, in, in, in transit. Uh, but still, I hope that our technology uh, holds up. Let me say a few words about the energy transformation. It is a fundamental transformation that is needed all over the world. We're shifting uh, the core of the energy system from a fossil fuel based energy system to a zero carbon energy system or very low carbon energy system. And the aim and need is to do this by mid-century. So uh, this is uh, not a task for one or two countries. Uh, this is a, a global need, given the very dire and uh, accelerating human-induced climate change. And there is uh, no part of the world more vulnerable to this than India. So no part of the world that should be pushing for rapid transformation worldwide than India. Now, the question is how to do this. And we have not succeeded uh, worldwide in achieving this for many reasons, uh, partly political economy. Who's going to take the first steps? Who bears the costs? Uh, the lobbies of the uh, incumbent fossil fuel producers and so forth. But I think that even a bigger challenge than political economy is the complexity of uh, making this transformation in real time in the context of the need and desire for ongoing rapid development in today's developing world. So this is a very complex task because it goes to all sectors of the economy and it requires deep technological transformation. I believe market forces alone are gravely insufficient for this challenge. They can't get organized around the the right trajectories they uh, of uh, their their um the investments that are needed since many of the investments are public sector rather than private sector. There is considerable amount of research and development and local adaptation needed. So the transformation is too complex uh, to think that market forces or even market forces uh, aided by a carbon tax or a permit system is going to be sufficient. My starting point, therefore, is that countries and regions need plans. And to formulate the plans, these are more than the short-term nationally determined contributions reported to the COP meetings under the Paris Agreement. These need to be 30-year plans of transformation. They need to be plans up to mid-century at the minimum. And by plan, I mean a detailed technological and policy pathway, a design of how to make this transformation. Now, the contents of the transformation are actually fairly well understood at this point. At the core is zero carbon power, electrification, 
with zero carbon electricity, whether from renewables or from nuclear or from carbon capture and storage uh, or from hydropower or other means. But zero carbon power is at the core of the transformation. Then is electrification of transport, electrification of cooking and heating in the, in the uh, uh, colder climates, and electrification of parts of industry, even parts of metallurgy, for example. For the parts that cannot be electrified, the zero carbon power will be used to produce green hydrogen uh, or other synthetic fuels as the base of the uh, non-electrified uh, energy using sectors of the economy. So this general uh, trajectory is now well understood in the course of hundreds of analyses, all pointing in the same direction. But the specificities depend on local context, how much sunshine, how much wind, how much hydro, how much capacity for carbon capture and storage, whether or not nuclear, and so forth. I believe that every country needs to have a 25 or 30 year pathway. I don't know what India's is. I don't even know what Europe's is because though Europe has a green deal, it does not have a clear pathway to achieve the targets of the green deal. So this is my starting point and my recommendations is that we know what we're talking about. Once there is a technological pathway at depth then one can make a policy pathway because part of that technological pathway is public investment. For instance, the core infrastructure is going to be designed in different ways because it is a zero carbon infrastructure. There's got to be charging stations, for example, uh, fit for electric vehicles. Uh, the cities have to be re reconfigured for electrification, uh, also for uh, buildings uh, and new building codes and so forth. So there's a lot of public investment that will be at the core of implementation. There's also, of course, a lot of private investment, independent power producers, to name just one, or the automotive companies, or the 5G telecoms providers that will be integrated with this new zero carbon technology or the hydrogen producers are presumably going to be private sector actors. So a plan of action is based on a pathway combined with a policy framework that clearly identifies the respective responsibilities, the investment responsibilities and the policy framework to push the transformation that is needed. Lots of other details are important. Uh, training and uh, capacitation, local adaptation of technologies and so on. The next step that I think is crucial is what is the industrial supply side of this transformation? I presume India is gonna be building its own solar modules. This seems quite clear. Uh, India is going to be producing its own wind turbines. India is going to be building its hydro power dams and so forth. That is a supply side that means the industrial sector will play a major role. And we all know the importance of strategic minerals in the battery supply chain, for example, of the electric vehicle industry. This is now also part of the industrial policy strategy of countries. Two more elements in my mind are absolutely central. Finance is probably the core limiting factor now, even in getting governments to do the homework of long-term transformation, because governments say, well, who's going to pay for all of this? The developing countries, by and large, do not have the credit ratings and the credit worthiness to finance this privately. Much of this financing needs to be official development financing. But we know the tragedy, almost the farce, of the rich countries wringing their hands that in uh, 14 years of promises and basically lies, they can't even get $100 billion together where they can do that at the snap of a finger if it's a war uh, in which they spent trillions or COVID in which they spent trillions. 
But for all of this transformation, the rich countries have basically faked it. And it's disgusting, actually, since the rich countries also bear the historical responsibility for the climate change that's underway. As a practical matter on finance, the most important things that we need are first a massive expansion of the multilateral development banking system. And that means a lot more paid in capital for the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Asia Infrastructure Bank, the New Development Bank of the BRICS, the African Development Bank, and others. This is the number one obvious agenda. And the country standing in the way of that is the United States, because the US Congress doesn't want to vote a capital increase. So it's blocking progress from all the rest of the world that is on side for this. Let's get this accomplished finally and tell the United States government, you did the most of the admissions, richest country in the world, you play your share and let them take that back to the Congress because this is an intolerable situation right now where one major country is blocking progress by all the rest. The second thing that will be needed is co-financing by large private or quasi uh, private or sovereign wealth uh, funds. There's trillions of dollars available, as we know. It doesn't reach developing country projects. It will come as co-financing with the multilateral development banks. So this financing issue is central. It is, to my mind, the number one agenda for the G20 is scaling up the MDB financing and not taking the nonsense of we're evolving the institutions that the US has put forward because evolving is just fine. But what it really means is delaying tactics to getting the capital is needed. The final point that I want to make is that transformation requires regional integration. Every part of the world, even India, needs to integrate its energy systems, its power grid with the neighbors the United States with Canada and Mexico, the ASEAN countries obviously linking Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and so forth. The Northeast Asian countries, China, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand integrated with ASEAN through submarine cables, the African Union becoming an integrated power system in Africa. We need the regional scale for efficient deployment of renewable energy systems because these systems can only be resilient and at cost, at low cost, if they are geographically dispersed and interconnected. So this is my final point. Strategy, plans, pathway analysis, financing, and regional integration. And I'll just close by saying that the G20 is absolutely crucial in getting this agenda properly underway, finally, because it is the place where the financing breakthroughs need to be made. I could not be more excited by India's presidency, because India has been saying the things I'm saying for years and years, and it's time to get it done. And I believe that this will happen in Delhi in September. Thank you so much for letting me join you today for these brief remarks. Thank you. We are ha very happy that you could join us jo and, and share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Most now, grateful. Thank you. Okay. Now I request Mr. August Ekam to uh, speak on a country director World Bank about share his thoughts. Is this on? Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Jyoti Parikh. 
um, Mr. Tarun Kapu, advisor to the Prime Minister. Uh, Professor Sachs, uh, thanks for your impassionate call for uh, greater capital for uh, multilateral development banks. Um, Dr. Kirit Aparik, members of the G20 working group um, on energy transition. It is really an honor to be here today to share with you uh, the World Bank's perspective on this very important topic that um, the G20 uh, presidency uh, has taken on. Before sharing with you my remarks, I really would like to uh, congratulate the government of India uh, on the uh, very successful uh, G20 presidency. You know, Professor Sachs said we'll, achieve, we'll see more results in September at the summit, but we are seeing impact already uh, of the India uh, G20 presidency. We're seeing that India is putting squarely the development agenda on the, uh, on the G20 uh, uh, agenda. Uh, we're seeing that India is broadening the voices uh, of the G20 to the global south. Uh, these are very important uh, uh, achievements. Um, and, and I personally think that uh, these achievements could not uh, be um, produced by any other G20 member uh, than India because of the importance of India in the global economy, now the fifth largest economy in the world. Also, the fact that India is connected uh, to all the voices that count in the global economy and India is uh, seen as a friendly voice. Uh, India is um, India also cares a lot about development and the global south. So. Uh, would like to, to, to thank India for that. And this is uh, important because the topic we're discussing today is a topic that cannot be addressed only from the perspective of uh, developed countries. In fact, it can be addressed only with a strong voice from the global south. We know that the previous uh, energy boom was to power industrialization in advanced economies. The kind of energy transition we're talking about is really to power development in the developing world, uh, is to bring developing the developing world to the level of development of developing countries. This is what the new uh, energy transition is really on about. That's why we care so much about it in the World Bank because it, it matters for our member countries who are, find, who are borrowing from the World Bank for their development. The transition to low carbon uh, energy um, is also a priority for the global uh, community because it will help us live on a better livable planet. It will make our environment safer. It will make our air cleaner. Uh, so it's an agenda for all of us. We know that developing countries have low level of energy consumption per capita. To give you an example, India's energy consumption per capita is one third of the global average. We also know that developing countries are growing fast. They're growing faster than developed countries. And as they grow, their energy consumption, consumption is going to grow naturally. And as their energy consumption, consumption grows, if the energy mix doesn't get changed, we will not be able to bend the global emission curve. So developing countries also have a big responsibility in ensuring that we bring the world to where we would like the world to be in, uh, and achieve the, the Paris uh, goals of keeping global warming to below 1.5. I'll come a, later on uh, and, and, and talk a bit about how this transition should be, how we can make it just for developing countries. But it's important to recognize that developing countries also have a responsibility because we want growth to happen, and we want growth to happen in a way that is less energy or carbon intensive than it has been for developed countries and for developing countries in the past. There are several That's sectors that need to be transformed. Uh, uh, Mr. mentioned all of them, I believe, so I will not repeat them. But those sectors uh, that need to be transformed, transformed are very important for development, uh, for growth in developing, developing countries. Uh, the agriculture is one of them, uh, and we mentioned already urban transport and industry and energy. 
The good news though is that electricity prices have come down significantly for new technologies and developing countries can invest more heavily into those technologies. They're becoming cheaper and we will, I would like to pause here to again congratulate India on the big progress made on solar, for example, uh, on the heavy investment that India has made in solar industry and, and that have also helped bring down the, 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 the cost of solar. Similar progress can be, can, can be expected in other sectors. But the, for us to really reach uh, the global goal, we need to all accept the fact that renewable energies are going to be disruptive and we need to be prepared for it. We need to embrace them. They're going to be disruptive because they're going to displace our traditional ways of producing wealth. Um, and they're also going to require a lot of investment. Even though we have achieved a lot, the future suggests that we need a lot more capital, a lot more investment, and Professor Sack referred to them. Um, and we know that uh, concessional financing from institutions, institutions like the World Bank will help, but it will only be marginal. It will not be the biggest source of funding for the transition. The biggest source of fundings are going to be, two, to be twofold. One is government funds, public resources, and two is private. Public resources are going to play a big role if they are directed to the right investment and create the right incentives and create platforms for private sector. But the biggest source of funding is going to be the private sector. Therefore, the private sector needs to see uh, that investing in the transition is, is, is worth their while and can generate profit for them. We, you know, private sector doesn't go where they don't see profit. So the, our common responsibility as institutions interested in policies is to help ensure that when policies are designed by government and when government expenditures are being planned, they create context and conditions for the private sector to, to come in and come in big. In this sense, we're seeing a lot of progress already under the G20, and the, this particular working group has done a lot, um, and we'll, we'll see more results going forward. Under this working group, and we're very uh, proud as an institution to be part of the G20 working group on the transition, uh, we have collaborated in three priority areas. We have presented the role of four low carbon technologies, uh, green hydrogen, offshore wind, battery storage, and carbon capture and storage in reaching net zero pathways in India, as well as in other countries. Second, we have disseminated global best practices on just cold transition, highlighting the underlying principles and institutional governance um, to put in place to mitigate the environmental and social impacts and options for repurposing coal infrastructure and land for alternative economic activities in coal dependent countries. And third, we have identified the potential the, of greater role to be played by regional power grid integration and deeper connectivity uh, between countries to support the energy grid in a way that creates opportunities for mixing um, new and traditional sources uh, so that the energy grid can have the greater composition of green electrons, as we call them. So in line with this, work, the work stream of this working group, and thank you very much for the ideas that you shared in the working group with my colleagues, which have also helped inspire how we support India and the, and the South Asia region. In line with the, these ideas, uh, we have uh, put in place at the World, at the World Bank a program to support energy transition in the South Asia region uh, with five pillars. The first pillar is uh, we are focusing on supporting core energy transitions. Under this pillar, we are mainstreaming least cost renewable energy sources such as solar and onshore wind. At the same time, we are working to accelerate the deployment of newer technologies such as offshore wind, battery storage, and green hydrogen. And we're also strengthening regional interconnections to make energy accessible to all. Under the second pillar, we're promoting supply side efficiency. Uh, we are encouraging reforms in the distribution sector and we're helping countries to upgrade their power grid 
Under the third pillar, we are improving demand side efficiency um, by encouraging uh, market-based approaches and by increasing the capacity of um, consumers to provide bankable uh, projects. Under the fourth pillar, we are prioritizing the decarbonization of the industrial and transport sectors. And um, under the fifth pillar, we're supporting just coal transition, as I mentioned earlier. Through the experience of implementation of those five pillars, we have gained uh, um, credibility, perhaps, and we also gained experience internally to support more countries. Uh, let me provide two examples of what we've done in India very briefly. Uh, that can help inform how we support other countries. Uh, first, our board of executive directors approved a 1.5 billion um, development policy loan called Low Carbon Energy Development Policy Operation to support the ambitious reforms that India is putting in place for renewable energy, uh, scaling up for uh, uh, green hydrogen and for boosting um, climate finance or energy uh, green finance, uh, including from the private sector. And we really command India on setting the way. I remember sitting, uh, you know, attending our board meeting on this operation where executive directors praised, uh, and it doesn't happen very often, they praised the, the bank management for doing something innovative and they praised India for showing how this can be done uh, to inspire other countries because India is doing it in a big way, in a very ambitious way, and we all need Really, we need big ambitions for the, the energy transition to, to happen. The second example I wanted to share with you is um, that we've been uh, working with India to leverage private sector financing in investment in rooftop solar. Um, uh, you know the example of uh, Rewav, where, uh, you know, in the case of the World Bank, with a $100 million financing uh, to uh, invest in. Um, in common infrastructures, uh, we were able to help India attract 4.2 billion uh, in private investment um, in, in solar. And I'm proud to say that um, the Delhi Metro is powered by solar energy produced from this investment. Um, so I wanted to conclude uh, by sharing with you a few thoughts. You know, they're a bit uh, personal, but they're also not disconnected from the work I do, which is uh, uh, at the World Bank. First, we want to make the energy transition smooth. We want to make it smooth uh, for various stakeholders. And to make it smooth, okay, I'll conclude. To make it smooth, we need, thank you, we need to uh, ensure that the traditional energy sector is not left out because you cannot have green electrons in your grid if you don't perform disco dis distribution companies or the, the existing grid. Uh, second, we want to ensure that uh, the traditional sector is not uh, unduly competing with the new energy, uh, with new sources. Therefore, we need to think about um, distorti distortive uh, incentives uh, in the traditional uh, energy sectors. And, and um, third, we need to make sure that developing countries that, are, that need energy to support their development are also well supported during the transition. And therefore, we need to think about the notion of transition fuel. What can they use in the existing mix to um, transition to new mix while also uh, supporting the development pro uh, process. Fourth, we need to ensure that uh, the lobby of countries that are heavily dependent on export of traditional fuel and fossil fuel is not preventing the world toward uh, the transition. And Professor Sack mentioned that a bit. We need to ensure that you know there is a global alliance uh, to 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 fend off uh, potential. Uh, lobbies from, from traditional sectors. Finally, I wanted to say that um, the energy transition, uh, for, for, for us, for, for me, what, it, what just energy transition means is first, it, has, it needs to have four pillars. First, it needs to be job creating for people. Therefore, new uh, activities need to create jobs. Second, it needs to be opportunity creating for communities and firms. Uh, third, it needs to be growth creating and growth enhancing for countries. And fourth, it needs to be trade enhancing and stability generating for the world. Thank you very much. Now, I request 
Mr. Mr. Tarun Kapoor, advisor to PM, Prime Minister of his Government of India. Good morning to all the participants and thank you Rade, for organizing this and inviting me here. Uh, energy transition is uh, probably one of the most important subjects being discussed in the world today and uh, also in India. So while uh, most discussions on energy transition are focused on climate and climate related issues, but I just add two more to that. One is uh, energy security and also affordability. So uh, energy transition, we uh, at least countries like India, we are looking at energy transition from, from uh, the uh, environment point of view, that is probably number one. But then uh, recently what we've seen is that energy security has also become very important. And uh, immediately after COVID, the way the price of natural gas shot up or uh, even um, crude shot up. Uh, affordability also becomes a very major question. And uh, for the developed world, the issues are a little different because uh, it was so surprising that countries in Europe could still keep buying natural gas even though the price shot up to over $50 from just around six to $7. But then countries like India, uh, there is a limit uh, beyond which then probably people or, or even countries or even large organizations may not be able to buy energy. So um, considering all that, uh, we, we have to look at sustainable energy sources, but those sources should be, should, uh, be such that uh, someone else is not controlling them and has this discretion to suddenly create artificial um, uh, deficiencies and push up the prices. So now uh, just looking at India where we stand, our uh, per capita energy consumption is amongst the lowest in the world. So we all know that energy consumption for the country is going to keep going up at least for the next 15, 20 years. In the developed world, almost they've reached a level where they don't need more energy. It's just that they have to shift from fossil fuel to cleaner forms. But in our case, we, we need more and more energy. So this more energy has to come from uh, some source which should be sustainable, reliable, and, and if possible, available within the country so that, so that our dependence, long-term dependence is not there. So... Uh, now, uh, just a few statistics. Very recently, a power ministry brought out some very good uh, statistics. Uh, the power secretary who was there is sitting here. And uh, I'm quoting mostly from uh, uh, this publication, which they brought out just a few days back. So, uh, and, and with this publication, they've also probably uh, improved the data which we were always quoting because they've they've got this uh, data first and they've collected it quite well so uh, uh, on um, uh, imports now the surprising thing is that even 25% of our coal is imported we we thought that we have enough coal resources we do have enough coal resources but then uh, certain types of coal coke and all which industry needs we are not producing in India, plus uh, 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 even power sector, there have been shortages, so we've been importing. So while on the on, on crude, we all know that 85%, more than 85% is imported, but even coal, about 25% is imported. That's quite surprising. Natural gas, more than 50%, we are importing. And, uh, uh, but the good thing is that even in energy terms, in the grid, at least now, uh, including large hydro, we are around 24% energy coming from renewables plus large hydro. So that's something good which has happened. But then grid contributes only about 18% of the total energy which we consume in the country. So just greening the grid is not going to help. A shift from molecule to electron or, or uh, more and more uh, 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 usage of energy from the grid 
is what would be required. And then also looking at uh, uh, such areas where we will have to use molecule or we will have to use, we can't uh, totally go on the grid. There, what could be the sources where uh, uh, cleaner forms or, or how to get those cleaner forms in, uh, in there. Now, if you look at the total energy, so 60% is coming from coal. So, uh, because industry is also using a, a lot of coal directly, while grid is using a lot of coal, but then industry is also using a lot of coal directly. 11% is coming from diesel and 6.5% from natural gas and LPG and petrol about 5% each. So, uh, which means that our coal dependence is large. And uh, can we shift from that coal dependence to renewable very fast? It, it will take time, but then uh, can we also have cleaner forms of coal? So that's, that's another major uh, question, which we are thinking at least in the short run. Uh, carbon capture is one, but coal gasification and with coal gasification, carbon capture, we've been talking about it quite a lot, but then now probably time has come. So, uh, so while energy transition in the long run has to be renewables all the way, but then in the medium term, the uh, transition fuels, natural gas, and some cleaner forms of coal, that is something which would be unavoidable for us, considering the fact that our energy requirement is going to keep growing and considering the fact that uh, there are some resources which we have in the country, which, uh, which uh, uh, would work uh, cheaper for us and would also provide the required energy security. Now, uh, let us look at the various uh, sectors which consume energy. So, from the supply side, let us move to the demand side. So, on the demand side, now 56% uh, industry is consuming. So, this is again slightly surprising because we thought it was around 40 something percent, but the statistics which Power Ministry has brought out recently says 56%. And, and in the last one year, the growth of grid energy uh, power from the grid has been very phenomenal. And it's been more than 10.5%. Earlier, it was it used to be just around uh, 3 to 4%. And most of this has happened because there's been a much, much higher demand from the industry. Uh, after industry, then transport is about 19%. Agriculture is, is about 18% in the household and various other sectors. So, uh, uh, so when we yeah. look at energy transition, uh, the two difficult sectors which one sees are, one is the transport sector, where currently renewable energy world over is less than 4%. It's 3 or 4%. And uh, there, the alternatives also seem limited, at least on the on the four, uh, two wheeler, four wheeler, one can see electric coming in in a big way. But um, uh, as far as transportation of, of goods is concerned, electric doesn't seem to be the right solution because then the battery size becomes too large. So, and hydrogen, very promising, but still taking too much time. The uh, cost has not come down to the level which we thought it would. But uh, uh, then uh, at least. On, uh, on the face of it, it looks very promising. So we have to wait till the cost of hydrogen or green hydrogen comes down to a level where we can use it for heavy transport. The other difficult sector, of course, is industries. Some of the industries which need probably very high temperatures and largely dependent on coal. So uh, biomass is uh, one alternative. Hydrogen, if it comes in, then could be the other alternative. But right now, dependence on um, coal, at least, say, steel, cement, and certain other industries, uh, one doesn't see uh, very good alternatives emerging, but then something will have to come out. And uh, then let me also talk a little bit about cooking, because household sector, at least in India, a uh, large number of homes, we managed to shift at least from untreated biomass to LPG. And currently, we have 32 crore LPG connections, probably uh, no other country has that larger number. And uh, uh, again, but, but uh, more than 50% of our LPG is also imported. So we can't depend on LPG for a very long time. So what, is, what are the alternatives for households or for cooking? So um, a shift to electricity would be a good thing, but then 
probably it's been a little dif difficult. Uh, households, the cooking habits and all probably have not been um, conducive and, and that shift has not happened, though from time to time government has been trying. Solar directly to be used for cooking, again, we've been trying, then uh, still some people use biomass, so better uh, stoves and, and more efficient means, again, not very great success. But then uh, biogas is one answer. And uh, uh, while we've done on a decentralized scale, we've, try, we've been trying to push it for a long, long time, not very great success. Now we are trying to push it on a larger scale with, with uh, slightly bigger size plants. And here we uh, should see some success, though uh, the target is to set up 5,000 compressed biogas plants, but we've uh, currently we have around 60 which are commissioned. But then large number of um, uh, letter of intents have been given more than 3,000. So there are some issues around it, but then uh, hope these issues get sorted out. So then biogas could be another answer. Uh, while talking of biogas, there are other forms of biofuel. So India has been laying a lot of uh, emphasis on ethanol and uh, the, su uh, the success has also been very good. Our blending is, is over 11% now and uh, we will reach 20% uh, before time. 20, 2025 is the year which uh, Prime Minister has announced, but I think we'll be able to do it before that. So, uh, uh, various alternatives are available to us. Greening of the grid with solar and wind, probably we have to move much, much faster than what we are doing now. We will have to do at least, say, 40 to 50 gigawatts every year in order to reach that 500 gigawatts non-fossil fuel target by 2030, which, which the PM has announced. Uh, but uh, that uh, seems still a little bit easier compared to uh, how to tackle the transport sector and uh, uh, industry, which is dependent on coal to a large extent. So uh, with this, I will uh, uh, end my talk and uh, again, thank all of you. Thank you very much for stress on affordability, who controls the energy source, the need for growth in this uh, developing world, especially, and the uh, concern about imports, of course, that related to who controls it, and st straightening out many issues regarding uh, sectoral aspects. Uh, now I request Dr. Kirit Pari. Arun Kapoorji, uh, Mr. Kwame, uh, Dr. Jyoti Parikh and friends. I'm here to thank the speakers for the contributions. And I know Dr. Amesha, Sri Tarun Kapoor has to leave at 12 o'clock, but before he, we release him, I want him to perform one more function. You know, we have seen how complicated the energy transition and its, its, its challenges and it, and, and as Jyoti had identified, covers many dimensions, not just economic, but also social and other things, and finance and so on. So I think many dimensions of sustainable development were identified in the talks today. And I think Professor Jyoti Parikh has been explored many of these over the years. And not only that, she has inspired many of her students and colleagues to work on some aspects or other of what we call the axis of sustainability or sustainable development. So the students have, and colleagues have uh, contributed to a fest ship in honor of Jyoti Parekh for her 80th birthday. And I would request uh, Sri Tarun Kapoorji to release this fest ship.
I thank all my colleagues and my PhD and master students at Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research and my colleagues at Irade who have written this and all the people who have written these, I have written joint papers with them. They have been close colleagues and I'm glad that oh, uh, decades of contacts with them has resulted in such a book. And um, it's very moving and uh, close to my heart. Uh, uh, this is a very big gift. Thank you so much. Uh, may I request Mrs. Jyoti Parik to please present the bouquet of flowers to Mr. Augustano. Mr. Augustano. And may I request Mr. Kirit Parik to please present the bouquet of flowers to Mr. Tarun Kapoor. <laughs> Can we please come together for a group picture? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's, let's proceed further with the next session. Uh, the next session is on country experiences on sustainable energy transition. And I welcome all of you once again who are present in person as well as on Zoom. The next session will share perspectives and country experiences of sustainable energy transition from India, China, Indonesia, South Africa, United States of America, Germany, and the United Kingdom. It will also deliberate key challenges and opportunities for enabling just transition in G20 countries. May I please request a session chair, Mr. Alok Kumar, former secretary, Ministry of Power, Government of India to please come on the dial. Please give a big round of applause, everyone. Next, we have a co-chair, Mrs. Gauri Singh, Deputy Director General, IRENA, United Arab Emirates. Ma'am, please come on the dais. Please welcome Dr. Anbu Mozi Venkata Chalam, Director of Research Strategy and Innovation for Area Indonesia. Dr. Rajay Rastogi, Chairman, Task Force, Sustainable Just Transition, Jharkhand, India. And Dr. 
James Kia, Professor of Sustainable Energy at Imperial College London, United Kingdom, is here virtually with us. Yes, please. Uh, Anjuman, can you please check if Dr. Jim Skia is there with us virtually? Done. Yes, please. Thank you. Fine. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we now intend to start this session. So I will request all the participants to kindly take seat and so that we can start without any further delay. So we are starting this session uh, on country experiences in sustainable energy transition. I'm very happy to introduce my co-panelist. The co-chair of the session is Mrs. Gauri Singh. She is Deputy Director General of International Renewable Energy Agency. We are joined by Dr. Jim Iski. He is a, he is a professor of sustainable energy at Imperial College London, UK. I have Dr. Anbu Muzi Venkatachalam who is from Economic Research Institute for Asia and East Asia, Jakarta, Indonesia. And we are also joined by Shri Ajar Astogi, who is who represents Jharkhand and he has been expert in the energy transition issues and climate related issues in Jharkhand. So what I propose that uh, <clears throat> we will all speak for about 10 to 12 minutes each and thereafter we will we will take some question answers and maybe after the question answers i will ask the each of the co-panelists for for giving maybe two to three suggestions which we can forward to the g20 from from this session Before I make my presentation, Thank you. Before I make this presentation, let me make a few initial comments. So we have been working for this energy transition transitions working group in the Ministry of Power for about 
almost full one year. And uh, in my presentation, I will share with you the, the issue note, the key priorities of India's presidency, which we have put on the table for discussions. And also what are the key features of the draft communique which is being negotiated? What I have realized as uh, the chair of this ETWG in first three meetings, that two, two major things. First, G20 process is very important, but it is extremely complex and slow because the country perspectives which come during discussions and during negotiations, they are very, very divergent. But this process is very, very important for success of any transition in the world. Because most of there are most of the countries which matter. It is also very important that India is the presidency because India's position in the global energy consumption is, is very dominant. Okay. India is currently third largest consumer of energy in the world. And by the projections we have with us, in the next 20 years, it will, it will overtake US and it will become second largest energy consumer in the world. The other two countries, US and China, their absolute energy consumption will not grow much. Most of the growth energy demand will come from, from India and these three countries. So whatever we do or whatever we don't do is going to impact energy transition. And one other important fact which, which, we, which we should keep in mind is that India has one of the lowest per capita energy consumption in, in the globe. So it is legitimate aspiration yeah, it has to become, but the goal it has set for it is that it wants to become a developed world by 2047. So these are the complexities that India is a very dominant energy consumer. It is going to grow very fast in terms of energy consumption and its path to become a developed world. Its growth, energy growth will grow. So there are two very difficult aspects which India will, like, will have to handle. Say energy growth for its development as well as also managing energy transition so that it contributes more than its share in the, in the global endeavor, global efforts for energy transition. So it was very, very interesting and very, very important that India is now the presidency brings the, the perspective of the global south. Most of the, the, the countries in the global south are, are developing countries. They will consume more energy. So what do they think and how to perceive the imperatives and the transition is going, is going to influence the G20 process, not only now in the subsequent years also as the Brazil and all that take the presidency. Another very important thing which <clears throat> emerged in the whole discussion is the is the almost consensus on need of multiple pathways. It is not one size fits all. That earlier there was so much of talk and emphasis on the phasing out of coal, but all during the conversations and discussions in our group, there is a consensus that every country will have its own pathway and there will be world will have multiple pathways. One last thing which I I I make my in my remarks before I come to my presentation is the the growth for India will turn out to be a boon for energy transition because it is far more difficult to switch to other energy sources when demand is not growing because you have to replace your systems. India will have golden opportunity of managing its energy transition through its growth. You can do the new technologies, new source of energy for the energy which you require now in future. So there won't be so much of pressure on 
replacing your existing energy assets. But it would be ultimately the leadership which will decide the success or otherwise of energy transition. Most of us are all democracies. Whatever we commit on the table, when you go back to our countries, our leaders have to convince their, their domestic constituencies about the imperatives of energy transition, the costs that is going to be imposed on your growth and your economy. You have to manage, you have to manage not only the technology and finance, you have to also manage the domestic constituencies because there will be many gainers and many losers. Some new players will gain in terms of the new energy sources, new energy projects, but many others will be the losers who are already in the in this energy business. So let me quickly share with you what is all going in the G20 Energy Transitions Working Group. This is most of it is no, known that how important is G20 process for success of any economic process and also the energy transition. I will draw your attention to the, the right side of the slide, the six priorities which Indian presidency brought on the table. And this was also a, a work which was done out of the multiple ministries in India which are working in the area of energy transition. So this was, we had our own internal processes. First off, first was energy transition through addressing technology gaps. I will deal with each of them, subsequent slides for one minute each. Low cost finance for energy transition. Mr. Tarun Kupra is speaking, energy security and diversity of supply chain. So India made, uh, made it priority of energy security. Energy efficiency, industrial low carbon transitions and responsible consumption. Fuels for future. And last but not the least, universal access to clean energy and just affordable and inclusive energy transition pathways. As I mentioned that Ministry Power is steering this, this group working group, but there is significant contribution from MNRE, Ministry of Coal, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, Ministry of Mines, and Niti Aayog. Three meetings have already been held at Bengaluru, Gandhinagar, Mumbai, and the last meeting is scheduled to be held in Goa. We have also organized so far 12 side events which have been hugely attended. By, by academia, by industry, by experts, and of course the delegation members, ranging from the CCUS to SMR, biofuels, the list is very long, offshore wind. So offshore wind, and in Goa also we have lined up five more side events. India has invited nine countries as guest countries in the G20 process in the Energy Transition Working Group. And we, have, we had also had the benefit of the viewpoints and presentations of 14 international organizations. Another key feature of India's presidency in etiology was the taking up the global studies in all 13 global studies. Eight have been completed. And this is a list of the global studies which have been completed like low cost finance for energy transition, MNRE is leading it and it has been done with the cooperation of ARENA and so many institutions. Then number three, addressing the vulnerability of supply chain of critical minerals, Ministry of Mines has led it. Many more are under pipeline. So these are the list of 13 studies. You can see the the, the extent of coverage, biofuels, green hydrogen, everything. And so far, eight studies which have been published are available on the website of Ministry Power. And remaining five will also soon come. They are in the final stages. Talking of the focus areas, First is the addressing technology gaps. 
so we have identified five technologies some of them are commercially mature so focus on their deployment and some other are emerging and new clean technologies they include carbon capture utilization and storage electrolyzers small modular reactors advanced chemistry cell battery storage high efficiency fuel cells this group is also working very closely with the the with the finance track our understanding has been that this group will throw up the demand of the low cost finance for deploying these technologies whereas the making available that finance will be the work area for the finance track so we are coming out this in this group with the with a broad estimate of the finance which will required for if want to deploy these technologies the third priority is energy security and diversity fight supply chain this is the key contribution significant contribution of indian presidency that this has come up as a very major major priority of this working group that while we progress on energy transition we have to do it in a way that it ensures energy security and diversified supply chains i can share with you that india's action plan for avoiding 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions between 2020 and 2030 we had prepared a plan action plan and half of it will come from energy efficiency other half will come from renewables that is the broad broad uh, say contribution of two sides so india's presidency has taken in a very very significant manner very important manner the area of energy efficiency industrial low carbon transitions that is hard to abate sectors and we have also added responsible consumption to to reflect our priority of life that is lifestyle for environment it is not only energy efficiency it is also the our how do we consume energy and how to control demand the fifth priority is the fuels for future we have taken up two fuels from indian presidency site for for building consensus one is the sustainable biofuels and other is the renewable and low carbon hydrogen earlier we start with green hydrogen but the current consensus seems to come down to renewable and low carbon hydrogen and its derivatives like green ammonia and the sixth priority area is the universal access to clean energy india's leadership it stands for ensuring the energy access to all including large number of people in african continent and also in other, all other countries to ensure that we have the energy transition which is just affordable and inclusive i'll spend this few minutes on these two slides what is the significant addition from presidency because all this communique are the continuum say each country when it says that okay it my presidency this was the consensus so you have to build upon this so it is not a fresh fresh slate so i have listed out the significant additions which india is trying to build in the communique first we are going to acknowledge that new technologies by name it is not general that technology new technology by name like ccus this five i have already listed the the intention is that once you identify a technology in g20 communique energy ministerial communique we were told and that the lenders the bankers they have greater confidence in funding those technologies this is going to be the contribution of of this this uh, endeavor global alliance of biofuel has already been announced in the recent visit of honorable prime minister to us and this is being spearheaded by our minister petrol natural gas because there are some reservations some countries like uk it says we have to add sustainable biofuels because they have their concern on food security and other things but it is emerging that biofuel is going to be the one big fuel for future as mr tarun kumar was also talking in the morning that for our transport and for our cooking needs the biofuels are going to be significant 
one another important significant addition is going to be a wide recognition that renewable energy will play an important role very significant role to accelerate universal energy access for developing countries and even within the renewable energy the decentralized systems will be in far more important so there are going to be several initiatives for for enhancing the knowledge and technology of dres in india's presidency the last bullet on the slide the fourth bullet is one which is which assumes a special significance in the context of a national green hydrogen mission so there is there is not much consensus on the word green hydrogen they say don't color the hydrogen don't label the hydrogen so we have come down to this we have now going to agree to almost agree to the renewable and low carbon hydrogen but they need to define it and it is the most contentious area in the whole negotiation because somebody is very happy with even the even the, the hydrogen produced from the natural gas but it emits as as high as around 11 kg of carbon dioxide for 1 kg of of hydrogen whereas the renewable hydrogens are less than less than life cycle uh, if you compare life cycle uh, uh, emission carbon emission it is less than 2 kg of carbon dioxide per kg of hydrogen so what india is trying to build consensus consensus around is there is a need of a harmonized global standard for defining the low carbon hydrogen and this standard is most likely is going to be the the carbon emissions you produce for producing 1 1 kg of hydrogen but what would be the number 2 kg 3 kg 4 kg that is proving to be difficult but this will be a major achievement for india that there is a global consensus okay that there has to be there is there's need to be a standard and the standard has to be in the the parameter has to be in the in terms of the the emissions per kilogram of hydrogen so that is one important thing which india is going to is likely to achieve there are talk in the morning about the the regional integration i am very happy that this is already one priority which we had started in september last year and this is this has got almost universal acceptance in the in the in the etwg meetings the crucial role of the transnational grid interconnections and cross border power system integration in enhancing energy security fostering economic growth and facilitating the global transition to low carbon energy future this is very good news for energy professionals in india we are also trying to build consensus on a road map for doubling the rate of improvement in energy efficiency globally but to 2030 and technology co development in hard to abet sector the third bullet i have already mentioned is the encourage people to adopt responsible and needful consumption habits by promoting awareness and advocating for behavioral change everybody has to be conscious the available carbon budget is very limited the scientists the experts that tell us that for limiting to 1.5 degree c it 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 could be 2028 or 2030 the carbon budget is going to be over at the current rate of consumption and the emission production emissions and for 1.5 degree c it is going to be over by 2035 and nowhere we see the road maps which were being talked clarity of technology is not certain finance is not available so the only, the best glimmer of hope for all of us for achieving the net zero is going to be that we have to move towards responsible and full consumption so that our energy demands come down that is one very important uh, element which india's presidency is going to bring and last is the evolve a road map for low cost finance for energy transition and enable support for developing de-risking mechanisms 
required for attracting private investments to bring economic feasibility in technologies such as offshore wind, battery energy storage, green hydrogen CCUS. One word for <clears throat> battery energy storage, I can tell you, India's power sector cannot complete its energy transition, say, in the next two, three decades, unless until we, we bring down the cost of battery energy storage. The scope for the flexible operation of coal based power plants, the scope for developing pump storage power plants is limited. And we'll exhaust most of it by 2030 or 2032. If you have to move beyond 2032 or to, uh, for energy transition for increasing the share of renewables, it has to come from the battery energy storage and we have to bring down the cost of energy storage. Currently, it is more than 10 rupees a unit. It is not affordable. So, Somebody in the inaugural session was talking of a clear pathway. I think Professor Jen, uh, uh, Professor who was who joined the virtually, I wanted to intervene. Okay, this pathway is not possible because technology technology path is not clear that which technology will succeed and which will become affordable. So it will it will have to be a gradual transition. However, we may be, we may be concerned. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. I will now. Now I have the pleasure of inviting uh, Ms. Gauri Singh. She brings more than 30 years of experience in policy advocacy and project implementation in the field of renewable energy and sustainable development, both from India and internationally. And she has had a long career uh, in the field of renewable energy and uh, sustainable development. So I now request Ms. Gauri Singh to make her presentation. Yes. Thank you so much, Alok Maharji. <clears throat> And thank you to Irade, uh, to ma'am and to sir to uh, give me this opportunity of presenting uh, some of my thoughts on the energy transition. I think um, the inaugural session and uh, what we heard uh, from Alok Kumarji pretty much sets the stage for um, you know, getting us a fairly good comprehension of where and how we need to go. I mean, maybe the how is not so clear but uh, at least where we need to go. And um, what I want to start with is maybe a, uh, just spend just one minute uh, to give you a global picture, which is um, optimistic at one level, but uh, you know it does come with certain uh, areas of concern. So uh, last year, as uh, some of you would have heard, we globally, we added almost uh, 300 gigawatts of renewable energy in, uh, both in the grid and in the direct use. And this represented um, almost 83% of uh, the capacity additions that happened and uh, bringing our uh, total renewables uh, in the power generation capacity to almost 40%. And uh, we, anyway, I think all of us know also about the huge declines in costs that have happened in renewable energy. And it didn't just end with the last decade that had seen very rapid decreases, but we also saw very uh, good year-on-year -year decreases in LCOE in both uh, solar and in the wind, even uh, last year, despite all the issues around supply chains and um, other uh, related issues that had ha happened. So, um, but one of the things that's uh, also clear is that most of this deployment is happening at very limited geographies. So it's it's uh, concentrated in, in China, US, EU. So they account for almost 75% of the deployment. And, uh, um, and you know, we, when we speak about, uh, uh, you know, investments, which have also, again, reached a, a, a global high of 1.3 trillion US dollars uh, with renewables and energy efficiency, almost about 700, uh, billion, which is also very uh, 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 real high, uh, again, despite all the inflationary pressures on labor and all. 
But uh, despite all of this, what we are also seeing is that um, the electrification with renewables in the hard to abate sector, the end use sector is going very slow. And there's an increasing gap in investments between the global north and the global south. And this gap is actually widening. Uh, in fact, if I just look at sub-Saharan Africa, it just received less than 1.5% of the total global flows. So obviously, you know, the when we talk about a, a, a global energy transition, or even if we talk about energy transition in the context of even the G20 countries, not all countries are moving at the same pace, nor are they being able to attract investments and financial flows at the rates and at the cost that is needed. Um, I'll just spend some time speaking about uh, three regions. And uh, these are three regions which I think are important because uh, um, they, they, have, um, they have countries in the G20 that have provided leadership in, um, in the recent years. Uh, so ASEAN, which has Indonesia, which has provided leadership just in the last G20. Uh, I'll also speak about uh, the Latin America, where we will have actually move, we'll move towards uh, the next G20 happening in uh, Brazil uh, and also talk a little bit about uh, Africa. I, I think we've already heard um, from the earlier presentations some uh, a very comprehensive picture of where we are going in terms of uh, the Indian context. So in the ASEAN, and I know uh, that uh, we will have uh, 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 panelists um, who will be speaking on Indonesia, but just giving you a, a sense of where the ASEAN is growing. This is this is a, a region with ten countries where we are likely to see rapid economic growth, and over the next few decades, and um, this will be driven both by growth in population, but also in the energy demand. And currently, the energy supply in these ten countries is dominated uh, by uh, over 85% of the primary energy supply is fossil fuel. So it's really at a crossroad of which direction this region will go, which is going to be a region of high growth and high demand. And uh, it can, you know, it can either go in uh, the path, which I hope it doesn't, of continued reliance on fossil fuel, because that's, that's not the path you want these countries to take. Uh, but alternatively, it could also choose to, to harness the huge amount of renewable energy that this region uh, is uh, home to. And um, if, if you look at where this, uh, the ASEAN region was in, uh, by the end of 2018, it had uh, almost 28% uh, of its 252 gigawatts that it uh, uh, consumes coming from uh, coming from renewable sources, mostly hydropower, and uh, um, this has by last year increased to about thirty three percent. So the region itself has had put a very ambitious target for itself for having um, uh, having twenty three percent of its primary energy coming from renewable energy by twenty twenty five and also a 35% share of renewable energy in installed capacity. Now, its share uh, in the installed capacity might still happen because it's uh, close to 33% now. Um, but in terms of um, um, you know, renewables accounting for 23% of the primary energy, I think it's very far from uh, reaching there because it's stagnating at around 14%. And it's been doing that for you know, almost uh, the last uh, uh, seven, eight years. So <clears throat> because um, you know, uh, power sector, as you know, is, is, a, is a, one of the dominant uh, sources that leads to higher emissions. So there is a, a large amount of focus on replacing coal in uh, that region. And a number of countries have also signed up uh, in the uh, COP26, Glasgow COP26, on moving away from coal. Um, but if, if, you, you know, if you're looking at the broad narrative that's emerging from the ASEAN countries, 
it is a it is a group of countries that are extremely focused on higher uh, you know getting a higher rate of industrialization happen and uh, it is uh, you know uh, what what seems to be emerging is that this is an opportunity for the asean countries to look at renewable so green this industrialization process as they move along this trajectory for energy transition um the the in in the short run solar pv and uh, electric vehicles will play a very major role um by 2030 we expect that uh, um you know the the region would have uh, installed nearly um 280 gigawatts of solar and put almost 13 million uh, um electric vehicles on the road and that would enable the region to meet the own aspirations that they have set for themselves but also be able to um, move forward in the energy transition and towards net zero targets that uh, uh, they have also uh, put their um statements out for transmission and distribution will definitely need expansion and i'll talk a little bit more on the on the grids which is pretty much the invisible sector doesn't not much gets talked about it but extremely important uh let me let me move to um to the latin american uh, countries which are much more developed they have about 95% electrification so in terms of access to electricity they're much more well developed they have good electricity markets and uh, um uh, but there is a huge reliance of these countries on hydropower brazil in fact because of its huge uh, igyasu um you know power project and the other hydropower projects that it has has uh, pretty much made shifted the the energy mix of the region more towards uh, hydro so um the big challenge now with the climate change that's happening is about um the impact that climate change will have on the hydro reserves and resources and which is why if if you're looking at the big narrative that can come that comes through from the latin american countries it's about diversification uh, of the energy mix these are countries that um are um i mean they have huge uh, energy resources both fossil and uh, renewables and um, um they also play a very important role as producers of oil and gas in fact oil accounts for a much higher share of total primary energy supply compared to the other uh, regions of the world and it's mainly being used for transport and uh, the other sector that uses up a lot of uh, energy is their industry which by nature of the industry which is more extractive and that's very uh, energy intensive so uh, the 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 uh, big discussion that's happening is uh, on two fronts how to how to use hydro power um, sources that are already being harnessed as um, being able to bring in more renewable energy into the grid because uh, these uh, are uh, really the um, the assets that can provide for the storage and flexibility in the grid system um, the other thing is that um, it, you know this is also region which has very well connected interconnected grids in fact central america has uh, some of the best interconnected grids um which uh, are also you know very capable of uh, of uh, 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 having a uh, i mean they've created a fairly deep um, market for electricity because of uh, the nature that it is and because of which it has been attracting huge amounts of investments uh, in fact in uh, 2019 uh, the clean energy investments in the region hit about 18 billion so it's it it gets about 6 to 7% of the total world um, uh, renewable energy investments 
and you have uh, brazil chile who are uh, uh, brazil chile and uh, argentina who really lead in getting investments uh, into the region um and most of the procurement is actually done by done through auctions so it's uh, in that sense you know there is some level of certainty because there's uh, there's a head planning that goes into it um and mostly it's coming into uh, into the wind now into solar pv and also biofuels um another very interesting characteristic of this region is the 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 depth of the financial institution the public financial institutions and that's a very important and they have played a very important role in being able to attract investments um if you if you're looking at um how these have been instrumental in in uh, channeling investments into the development of uh, domestic markets in in chile in honduras nicaragua and mexico but they've also uh, been able to attract investments in creating local value chains brazil and uruguay are good examples and most importantly have also been able to attract investment by putting conditionalities of local content and local labor so created jobs so this has been a very important facet of the way the the uh, latin american countries have actually moved into uh, getting more renewables into the grid but also in their pathways for the future for getting uh, getting uh, uh, more investments for uh uh more renewables uh, um as they move forward for the energy transition now very quickly i'll just spend a couple of minutes also on what the african context is and uh, in in uh in africa as we know that the narrative has to be the development narrative it it uh, you know the if you say energy transition i think most of the countries and the 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 leaders and uh, the policy makers take a lot of offense because they they pretty much ask to transition from what because it's it's a it's a continent that uh, and especially the sub saharan africa is uh, you know the the uh, electrification rate is only about 46% and there are almost uh, 1 uh, billion people who lack access to clean cooking fuels and technology so it's it has to be a development narrative that will drive uh, the energy transition in countries in africa um uh, what's um, uh, also important is that um, you know while the grid electricity you know that's that's the most attractive uh, format and uh, we we see that most of the countries are very eager to get more capacities uh, in the grid but uh, what's also coming becoming very clear is a lot of the countries have higher generation capacity than the transmission capacity transmission and distribution capacity so a number of countries in africa are actually capable of generating more electricity than they are capable of transmitting and distributing which is obviously a, a huge bottleneck and we all know that uh, you know grid planning and gestation is is anywhere between 5 to 7 years um so distributed renewables will definitely have to you know play a very major role and they also link in well with the development imperative of uh, providing access to energy to productive needs to education to healthcare uh, and uh, also meeting the sdg goals and it's not surprising that the investment that has come into africa is it has been as i said was 1.5% uh, of the global flows uh, uh, in 2020 but if i just break it down 90% of this actually got moved into a very few countries in africa so it went to countries in north africa it went to um, you know kenya tanzania and to south africa so again um, if you're looking at central africa or even west africa the investments that went in um into re renewable energy were 
were almost uh, almost negligible. Um, so there is, of course, this uh, divide within how the countries are moving in Africa in terms of their own capacities to attract investment and to be able to uh, get capacities uh, deployed. But uh, it's, it's also getting reflected in terms of the divide between private sector funding and public sector funding. Because uh, uh, again, if you're looking at the big recipients of uh, private capital, they have been Southern and North Africa. The others have to have had to rely much more on public sector financing. And China was the largest lender, followed by some of the, uh, uh, the uh, multilateral development banks like African Development Bank, World Bank, and GCF. But still, if you're looking at the absolute numbers of uh, um, money that's going in in Africa, it's, it's really very small. And, the, and what we've seen is in the recent years, it has declined even more. So uh, clearly, you know, this reflects that uh, the challenge, I think this is another angle that needs to be added to the complexity of energy transition as you see it that it's, it's uh, uh, not just how countries will manage it within the country itself, which is it in itself a very complicated process because it, uh, it involves uh, getting, I mean, energy transition has to be an economy-wide transition. It, it cannot be just a transition in the power sector, but looking at how industries will uh, make the transition, how buildings will become more uh, efficient and how the industry will also reduce its emission. Um, so um, uh, just a couple of points before I end. Uh, uh, the grids have always been an invisible element in this whole, uh, you know, whole narrative. And whenever we speak, it's much more about deployment. And grids will also involve or, or need nearly 600 uh, billion US dollars on annually, both in terms of uh, expansion of the network, but also in terms of uh, flexibility measures that will need to be put in as more variable renewables comes in. Um, finally, I think, you know, the whole paradigm around uh, uh, international cooperation has to change. It cannot be the, the way international cooperation has happened in the past few years, which, you know, we also heard from Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the 100 billion has never reached the developing countries. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, we think that uh, uh, international cooperation would need to focus much more on uh, getting an aggregation at a regional level. We also heard uh, in the inaugural session how important regional integration and regional uh, planning and uh, uh, action is, um, as also looking at low cost of financing, mitigating the risk that the private sector will not pick up, which is essentially the country risk and uh, uh, also the currency risk. That would need to be picked up by financial intermediaries like the MDB and others. Uh, and uh, um, because uh, uh, these risks are preventing the capital flows to moving to the developing countries. Um, and uh, um, Finally, I think you know, with uh, uh, with the way the G20 communique is coming out, I, I think uh, a lot more focus has to be on universal access um, to affordable and clean energy, as is also clear from the communique. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gauri Singh ji. Uh, it was very rich and very very informative uh, intervention now we have got around 30 minutes left for this session so we'll have to really manage our time so i will request the other speakers to to maybe limit their interventions in the boat 9 to say 9 to 10 minutes so that we have some time for discussion also i now have pleasure to invite professor jim miski who is who has joined us virtually he is a professor of sustainable energy at Imperial College London, and he has research interests in energy, climate change, and technological innovation. He is co-chair of IPCC Working Group Third. 
So I hand over to Professor Jim Ski. Please, uh, Professor, you can make your intervention, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, and good morning from good morning from London, and good afternoon to you in in Delhi. And thanks for the invitation to participate in this session. I've actually known GOT and Karit Parikh for a long time, so it's a pleasure to catch up with them, even if it is uh, virtually. I'm going to focus my remarks around the idea of a just transition, and I'm going to build on two roles that I currently fulfill. First, internationally, as the current co-chair of Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on Mitigation, but secondly, as chair of a government-appointed Just Transition Commission in my native Scotland. So taking IPCC first, the, the last Working Group 3 report, and I should acknowledge at this point my fellow co-chair of Working Group 3, Professor Shukla from Ahmedabad University in India, the report came out just over a year ago, and it was scoped following the inclusion of just transition in the preamble to the Paris Agreement, but just before the concept was put on the map by the Polish presidency at uh, COP24. The phrase does not actually appear in the scoping document of the Working Group 3 report, but we brought it in under the banner of equity considerations, most noticeably in a new chapter on mitigation and development pathways in the near to midterm, which tied climate action very firmly to wider socioeconomic considerations and broader development goals. Now, at the time, uh, the chapter noted that as of 2020, there were seven national commissions in place on just transition, as well as seven other sets of national policies and many other actors, networks and just transition movements. It noted the German phase out of coal subsidies and subsidy reform packages in Iran, Namibia, Philippines, Turkey and the UK, and a comprehensive programme in Spain, which covered early retirement for minors, redundancy packages, retraining for green jobs and priority job placement for former minors. And it's very noticeable that these initiatives are all really related to the coal industry. Now, there's no precise definition for just transition and local context absolutely matters. But the guidelines that have been set out by the International Labour Organization capture the main elements. And in the IPCC report, we identified a number of common elements to just transition action. So first of all, research and early assessment of the social and employment impacts of climate policies. And I would actually interpret that much more widely as the need for credible and informed forward planning. So really echoing Jeffrey Sachs' remarks in the first session about the importance of planning. Secondly, social dialogue and democratic consultation with social partners and stakeholders. The creation of decent jobs, active labour market policies and rights at work, and investments in establishing low emission and labour intensive technologies and centres. Realistic training and retraining programmes that lead to decent work and economic diversification based on low carbon investments. Now, in fact, the world has moved faster uh, than science has or IPCC has. We now have the so-called JETPs, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, which can accelerate country-led energy transition through international cooperation by expanding access to public and private finance to support energy system investment needs. And these have been applied to South Africa so far, which is quite well advanced, moving on to Vietnam and perhaps other countries as well. And in the next IPCC cycle, which starts later this month, there will be an opportunity to access the progress of these initiatives. But just a couple of personal observations on reference to just transition on the international stage. There was a subsidiary bodies meeting of the Climate Convention in Bonn last month, and many delegates there talked about the wider application of the just transition concept not just about coal, but about all energy supply, not just about energy supply, but also energy demand, and not just energy, but other sectors such as land use and agriculture. And going even further, not just about mitigation, but about adaptation to climate change as well, where the ILO principles could be applied. So it would be useful to get a sense of the boundaries of the concept. 
And just to say, there's also a risk, I, I feel, that the phrase is used as a kind of magic dust to sprinkle on energy transitions to make it appear easy and as if we've solved the problem. It is not easy. As my experience in Scotland shows, it's a really hard job to achieve a tra the energy transition in a just way. So just a few words about the Scottish situation. The last coal-fired power station closed in Scotland about seven years ago, and mining activity had ceased before that. Coal use is now in the rear view mirror, but the impacts of what was an unplanned and an unjust exit from coal are still to be seen in economically scarred communities with high levels of unemployment. So there are important lessons to be learned from their experience. And there are new challenges to be faced. Scotland has been a major offshore oil and gas producer. This is a mature province, the reserves are declining, and the country now has to face up new challenges, especially given the projected declines in oil and gas demand in scenarios compatible with the goals of the Paris Agreement. But at the same time, there are huge opportunities in the renewable sector, including repurposing skills that were developed for offshore oil and gas to apply them to offshore wind. And there will also be opportunities for the existing workforce to take up employment in carbon capture and storage and hydrogen. Now, with all these issues in mind, the Scottish Government established a Just Transition Commission in 2019, and I had the privilege of being appointed chair. And I'd like to flag that it's not a scientific body, so I'm not doing it as a professor of Imperial College or whatever. There have been a couple of academics involved, but it mainly engages businesses, trade unions, environmental groups and community bodies. And it's very much about real jobs for real people and real communities. And that's a very healthy reminder for someone who is so heavily engaged with IPCC. I'll just say the Commission took a very early decision to take a broad view of just transition. We have a big issue of energy poverty in Scotland, so the demand side is also in. We have an unusually concentrated pattern of land ownership. And there are major equity challenges arising from tenant farming and the conversion of land from agriculture to forestry, for example. And the electrification of transport actually poses big challenges in rural areas. So the Commission identified four prerequisites for a just transition. First of all, pursuing an orderly managed transition to net zero that creates benefits and opportunities. It needs to be a national mission. It's not just for government, it's for all stakeholders. And this really emphasizes the need for credible planning. And I emphasize credible because fantasy plans don't help, help anybody to make uh, you, you, you to plan their way forward. Second, equipping people with the skills and education they need to benefit from the transition. Third one is empowering and invigorating, commun invigorating communities and strengthening local economies. It's all not at the national level. And finally, making sure that the benefits are shared widely and ensuring that any burdens are distributed on the basis of ability to pay. And this is particularly to address challenges faced by energy consumers. And just to say, we can make it all sound gloomy, but we're also to emphasize that there are big economic opportunities from the transition, not just risks, and a chance to uh, address existing injustices, which every country has. We made a really important recommendation two years ago for the government to actually appoint a minister with a specific responsibility for just transition. And in the event, we now have a cabinet secretary whose portfolio covers net zero and just transition. And we have just transition sectoral plans under development in energy, in transportation, in buildings and construction, and in land use and agriculture. And in addition, we have a geographically focused just transition plan for the Grangemouth Petro, Petro, uh, Petro, Petroleum Refinery and Petrochemical Complex, which really ties into hydrogen and CCS. So the machinery is there, but the challenges are great. Renewables jobs are less well rewarded. They're less well paid than those in oil and gas, and we have to face up to that. Many of the wind energy components are being imported rather than being manufactured locally. 
And this is leading to demands, for example, for trade unions for more requirements on local content has already been flagged. The cost of upgrading the country's poor housing stock is daunting, and people on lower incomes find it difficult, for example, to afford electric vehicles. And finally, farmers are challenged on multiple fronts by climate change itself, the conversion of land, which is driving up land prices, and by shifting dietary habits. Now, none of this is easy, but the basic elements of a just transition strategy, that's planning, reskilling and upskilling, engagement with communities and stakeholders, and attention to finance and the sharing of costs and benefits, will allow these difficult issues to be addressed in at least a systematic way. Whether you're an idealist or a realist, there is a good justification for a just transition. The pragmatic reason is unless we do this in a just way, we will not get the social acceptance and buy-in that we need to enable the transition to be made in the first place. And the principled reason is it's just the right thing to do at a moral level. So let's leave it, let me leave it on that high note. Thank you very much. Uh, within the time available, uh, I think it was a very good presentation, very effective, and you gave us the your shared experience of this setting up a full time commission and a full time minister for the for the importance of this transition. And I completely agree. You said what I was also saying that unless until there is a we manage our domestic constituencies, will not we will will not reach where we want to reach in terms of the transition. It will not happen in G20 discussion tables. It will happen in democracies and with the managing the local constituencies and their welfare. Very well said. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I, I hope that you will stay with us during the session. Uh, now, I have the pleasure to invite Dr. Venkat Chalam and Bumuzi. He is the Director of Research and Strategy and Innovations at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, Indonesia. And uh, he brings us a very rich experience in uh, in the policy uh, uh, and also uh, the actual implementation yeah dr anbu yeah your presentation was there with us yesterday you yeah you mailed to us also it was there before i made presentation so you have to go to thank the you desktop. alabji and yeah. and uh, it is my pleasure to be here and uh, share some of the dilemmas and uh, experiences of Indonesia in uh, transitioning from the fossil fuel to the renewable. And uh, yeah, the first one. Time is short and, and uh, basically there are there are three messages that is I would like to uh, share. And uh, one is, uh, yes, yes, has uh, been reflected. This uh, energy transition is a complex process and this is costly. And sometimes it has a ne negative impact in, in the short term. Uh, but the second message is and we don't need to be uh, pessimistic, but there are opportunities and that's opportunities comes in the co-benefits that comes with this uh, energy transition. If it is captured and still we can make a kind of win-win situation. To make it win-win, uh, and um, uh, we need uh, more more cooperation. That is the cooperation at the regional level and the international level. And uh, uh, this is what what the story of um, Indonesia wants to, to share. And uh, yes, as mentioned by Chair uh, Alokumar Ji, and uh, uh, the, the 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 dilemmas are the complexity of Indonesia is similar to India, and and. Uh, where this uh, our aspirations um, and uh, and also this this dilemma is focusing on achieving one is how we can achieve the energy security second thing is to contribute for the environmental targets and third one is that equity that is affordability and with this aim and basically that is in the cup 28 glasgow and, and indonesia went there and and with the hope that is uh, more funding will be coming in. But what they got is a kind of a peer pressure to commit for more uh, emission reductions or the zero uh, carbon. And, and uh, 
this has been reflected and the last year it is indonesia's presidency they came up with this uh, uh, climate uh, uh, bali compact and also jet uh, P programs they agreed on and and uh, there is a consistency and continuity that is the um alokumarji mentioned that is the priority areas where that is the high level consensus evolving but 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 the, 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 from the developing south and from the indonesian perspective this energy transition need to be accelerated uh, with this economic growth um and this needed disruptive innovations that is, that is a basic uh, narrative or imperative of uh, that is that is driving the energy transition. Uh, so if, if you look into the future by, by 2060, where it is uh, Indonesia has committed for the net zero and, and uh, here we, our estimates say that is that to achieve the net neutrality need uh, more deployment of uh, uh, this uh, renewable energy technologies. And, and here this country has a lot of opportunities for the solar PV and uh, offshore wind, hydro and geothermal biomass under the renewable energy sector. And we do have the nuclear and particularly the small and model reactors and the hydrogen. So the, the opportunities are huge. But the thing is uh, how much it cost for this, this to achieving this net zero. And, and uh, with this available, at the same time, we need to, we cannot forget uh, Indonesia is sitting on a high quality coal, and uh, which is affordable. And then Indonesia is uh, very much integrated with the global economy. Uh, and so the effectiveness of this economic competitiveness comes with the affordable and the cheap uh, providing these energy resources at, 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 at the uh, scale it is needed. And uh, this is a kind of a current uh, policy instruments that is uh, uh, Indonesia is employing. And, and uh, the core pillar is uh, how that is the energy sector is getting decarbonized. And uh, they, they, they have been inviting that is the, the, the proliferation of uh, renewable energies are moving in and, and through, through feed-in tariff mechanisms. And also there is indirect taxes on the fossil fuel, but still if the cost effect is point of view, and still there is, there is more, more focusing on the energy efficiency in the demand side management. And third one is also it is putting and a and, uh, lot of um, uh, effort on, on uh, induced fuel, particularly the EVs and the biofuels uh, it has been coming in, but not at the scale or the, not at the speed that has been required and, and because uh, most of the developing countries including indonesia basically they are the they when coming to the r d and that innovations uh, they are the second movers and and uh, it is it is a hard to to put the first time of uh, investment but there are opportunities and uh, another narrative i think alok Marji also mentioned and and uh, it has been repeated by uh, mr gauri singh and and uh, one is that is the the, the the sustainable energy transition is very much linked to these uh, hdis and and your quality of life this shows that is if you look into that indonesia it is it is very much basically it is 0.5 megawatt kilometer and but but if you look into these advanced economies that uh, they, their per capita emission and also consumption is very high and so it is a kind of a social justice and so social equity issues so, so what type of uh, future electricity that is the energy that is we are providing to them? So that is they, they, they need to achieve these uh, uh, high levels of HDI. And, and uh, the, the, here, here the social justice issues comes in and here the coal has its own fossil fuel has its own narratives to tell. At the same time, so for most of them, it is uh, uh, some of the households in the, in the small islands of Indonesia, they don't have the access to the electricity. Around 13% doesn't have the access to the electricity. For them, the first access to the energy could be uh, clean and green. So this is a kind of uh, impact study that is we did for, for Indonesia and, and if they completely phase out to this uh, uh, coal and, and uh, by, by 2030 and uh, by removing it and we found it is going to an impact and this is the, their economic growth going to minus. I think it is uh, when, when compared to the current level. And, and it has been reflecting. It is also, Indonesia is also exporting the coal. And, and if, you are, if you are facing out, uh, it has been reflecting basically, and, and the current accounts of balance may go minus 30%. And, and uh, this has some hard implications on the, on the small households. 
and also this electricity price we estimated that is uh, depending upon where this resources are will be replaced by the renewables it may go from uh, plus 3.5 to, to, to 12.3 and and uh, so so it it has an implications on the on the on the economic competitiveness and of course that is uh, we have the positive implications on the emission reductions uh, <laughs> Sorry, but but there 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 are stories that is that is uh, uh, we we can learn from the countries. For example, it is a German story, and and uh, German when 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 they when they come out of this um, uh, Cold War, and and when their economy is accelerating, and uh, it is ninety percent dependent on the coal. And today, I think the last year they also achieved hundred percent renewable energy. But the transition from from ninety percent to the zero percent has an impact. And if you look into from the 1960 to 1980, their unemployment rate has been increased. Uh, then it was flat and then it reduced. So how, how that is uh, German has achieved this kind of a social resilience? It is, it is by their investment on the, on the renewables and also the new type of industries that they developed. And this is a kind of a one, one message that is that is a developing South can link and they can look into it. And that is the, how, how can we build a social resilience from moving from the fossil fuel to this renewable energy and achieving the maximum benefits. And um, so for, for in the case of Germany and, and they say, they, they, they put a lot of the investment on the technological invention, not only on the technological invention, how these technological inventions are converted or transformed into a business model, and it is exported to the global needs. And, and uh, this is where this revealed comparative advantages comes in. And, and uh, if you look into it and uh, some of the pioneering technologies and where this uh, German stands uh, for, for the Green Innovation Index, and, and also some of the new technologies in the storage and the road transport, they are leading the global. So, so once we are concentrating, moving from the um, uh, fossil fuel to the renewable energy and uh, transforming this renewable energy into an export model, still you can gain and you can, you can win this battle of uh, energy transition. So what could be the future pathways for the global south taking into that is the experiences of indonesia and uh, here basically um there, there are three ways that is one is one is uh, um three principle one is that the effectiveness and then here this is the renewable energy pathways need to be integrated and as, as madam mentioned about it uh, uh, this this grid interconnectivity and the, uh, developing the renewables and integrating into the grid and transforming for the, for the cross border transfer. Here we can see a kind of a win-win situation within the regional level. And the second thing is the efficiency and the equity. And where it comes and here we, 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 we calculated and, and what could be the cost for achieving the net zero. And here we find for, for Indonesia, that could be a positive concept. And in Indonesia, India's case, it's also the cost could be negative. But but that how how it could be coming in basically developing now these carbon markets are evolving and so this energy transition is linked to these carbon markets then we can successfully and are, are partially we we can we can bring the equity issues and the efficiency issues. Third one is uh, for the developing countries like Indonesia and and also in the in the uh, India and we need to be looking to the co benefits of moving into, for example, developing the solar value chain and, and uh, at, the, at, the, at the local level, at the regional level, will bring uh, energy security at the, at, the, at the state level and, and also it can contribute for the air quality. So my, my takeaway here is that is, that is uh, if you are thinking about the energy transition from a uh, developing country perspective, particularly which country that has been rich in the coal resources, uh, it, it, that is, uh, uh, then that could not be a kind of a one 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 solution or one way that is fit into all. Basically, it had to be a differentiated, but uh, a, a common but a differentiated approaches. So, if you combine together Indonesian and uh, German experiences, then you see that is the importance of integrating the uh, energy policies and then climate policies and that innovation policies. And the third message is uh, during the coal phase out, uh, government should consider incentivizing the deployment of renewable energy. It has to be go parallelly 
and that should be the, suitable to the country's power sector landscape and then innovation potential. So far, this innovation potential is very much limited in the global south. So for that, the, the countries need to be uh, continuous in the technological innovation and diversification of the renewable energy base. And also, these grids need to be made flexible and, and uh, the stable during this uh, transition period. And finally, I think uh, we need to look into this international cooperation, particularly where the countries uh, can come together. One is the developing the renewable energy and the trading, both in the case of renewable energy and uh, as well as the carbon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Venkatachalam. Uh, now I have the pleasure of inviting Mr. Ajay Rastogi. Mr. Ajay Rastogi is a he has done a long a long stint in the Indian Forest Service, and he has held several positions. And presently, he is uh, the chairman of the task force on sustainable energy, destiny transition, green hydrogen mission, Jharkhand. And he is an experienced climate expert, and he represents. He his, has been representing the government of Jharkhand in various international conferences. Dr. Rastogi. Thank you very much. I think I'm the last speaker and a lot has been spoken by my earlier speakers. Uh, regarding energy transition, I'd like to give you the brief view why Jharkhand has created this task force for sustainable energy transition. That will be the provincial view of the energy transition. See, the first and foremost importance for energy transition is for a state like Jharkhand and for a country like India, it is the energy security which matters. Because when you are developing, and as we have a goal to be a developed country by 2047, our energy demand is going to increase by more than 3% per annum. So we have a challenge and then we have an opportunity to develop from developing economy to developed economy. And the transition, as Mr. Rup Kumar has said, is going to be much easier for India because we can cannot phase out or we should not phase out the ex existing power plants or existing source of energy, but we can also develop and we can also depend on new technologies. For India, recently we have seen in the world that prices are controlled, that uh, fossil fuel prices are controlled by external world, by ex uh, they are not controlled inter nationally. So how to overcome? If you look at India's import bill on fossil fuel, it is around more than 20% of the entire import bill. If India has to be out nearby, then we have to rely on our self-reliant local technology which is sustainable and which is equitable. As far as when we speak about Jharkhand, I'll give you certain figures about Jharkhand. Uh, many people may be aware. We are having 40% mineral reserve of the country and we supply 30% coal for the energy security of the country. And when we look at the energy development of the state, 98% energy comes from the coal. That is the fossil fuel. Contribution towards renewable is very, very less, though we have very good insulation. It is fifth best state in the country to have a insulation, but we could not develop much solar. So while transiting from fossil to non-fossil based economy, I think for us, it will going to be very important that it should be just and equitable. When we talk about just, my previous speaker was talking about uh, his experiences about just and equity. So it's not about the rehabilitation of formal worker in transition process. It is about the entire economic diversification plan, which is going to be very, very important for states. Developing new opportunities in greener job or greener job are not as payable as that uh, traditional energy sources, what we are doing now. 
So how to create a balance? The kind of a development, if you look at Jharkhand, we have 13 districts today out of 24 producing coal. We have five districts, their economy is dependent on coal. That is the steel which has come up. We produce a lot of crude steel and finish steel also. So way for Jharkhand is much different from any other state in India. It is going to be much more complex for us. When we talk about formal sector in coal India, it's about 3.5 lakh people are only, uh, they are on the payroll of the government of India. But when we go to the district where mining started early, the informal economy which has set in around coal, it is much, much higher. Yes, much, much higher. So we need to take care of those people, those who are affected, those going to be affected by the transition, how it is going to be just and equitable. First, we need to assess. Then we have to plan. The planning is not is, uh, attaining net zero is by 2070. So how to plan? It should be a short term, mid term and long term planning has to be there. Because the formal worker which are employed today will phase out very soon because almost they're on an average, their age is around 40. So next 20 years, you may not see the formal worker if they have to phase out. But what about the entire ecosystem which is based on coal? The need to be mapped and there has to be economic diversification plan for those. We have to create, we may have to create, repurpose those areas which are going to be vacant, which are going to be available if mining is not sustainable. Because coal for India, I think uh, even for Jharkhand, uh, we need to have three uh, tier planning. One is short term, that uh, what we are, uh, long term is, mid, mid term could be that uh, Jharkhand has 26% of the coal, but how can coal be a cleaner coal? How can we convert into liquid? How we can convert? There are processes available now. A lot of technological innovation is taking place. So mid term, it could be a coal gasification could be the alternative for Jharkhand for moving towards a cleaner energy. Second, we have around more than 28% of countries CBD. So harnessing that CBD, that uh, impact of uh, coal bed methane is much lesser than the coal. India has around 2,600 billion cubic meter of uh, CBD. Then if we harness even 10%, then India can save a lot of foreign reserve to the tune of, uh, it is estimated about 2 billion USD can be saved. So if Jharkhand is having 30%, around 27% CBD, then it could be the real economic diversification for a Jharkhand. See, the problem is not that simple. It's about not about phasing out coal. It's not phasing about electricity. Greening the electricity, shifting from molecule to electron is not that simple for Jharkhand. We have a hard to abate industry in our state. And this the technology which is uh, evolving today, it is not certain which technology is going to occupy which place how to convert greener steel, how to make it economically viable, who is going to buy that steel, that cost uh, which is estimated today, if we have to infuse hydrogen at today's rate, it comes to around 26,000 rupees per metric ton. Is additional cost is going to be added to the making a green steel. So where is the demand? Who is going to bear the demand? That is one. Second is, we are the mineralized state. Transportation contributes a lot of emission, a lot of carbon is utilized in transporting minerals. It's not only about coal, it is about iron ore, it is about bauxite, it is about copper. So if you do not tackle long haul vehicles, because electricity uh, is not going to be the solution for as the technological presentation and everybody know, world market is only three to 4%. So what could be the long-term solution for long haul mobility? That is also going to be the key challenge for a state like Jharkhand because we do not have 
lot of networks where conveyors are being used. Now, Coal India has made announcement that a lot of investment will be done on conveyors. So they are going to be, they are trying to create that uh, mobility uh, more carbon friendly. But what about steel? What about bauxite? What about other minerals? Because the interstate transportation, you cannot rely on EV because the battery load is going to be very, very high. And hydrogen, of course, it is very promising, but the cost is skyrocketing. It cannot compete. It cannot compete. Even the technology is not certain. What kind of a technology is going to be there? That is going to be very, very important. And who is going to bear the cost? That is also very important. Because transition is about the people. It's about the economy. It is about economic diversification creating a new job opportunities, skilling and reskilling of the local people so that they get an opportunity to earn their livelihood. That is going to be the key. And who is going to, where is the concessional finance? Where is that available? How is state is going to access that kind of finance? That is also going to be a challenge for us. So, just transition is about not only tackling coal phase out, it's not about electricity, it's about economic, it is about integrating economic development of any region or any country that is going to be very, very important. How do we access those funds? Because we have been listening a lot that a lot of funds are available, but actually it is not coming uh, where it has going to come. In the earlier session also, we see that uh, some countries are blocking the fund, which were promised they could not reach to the developing countries. So mandate what we are, we are trying to do, we are not trying to focus on only on coal transition in our state. We are trying to create a recommendation like uh, some other countries have already made, integrated approach for just inclusive and sustainable transition. And for Jharkhand, because we have more than 33% forest cover. So biomass will be the game changer for the state. Because the steel industry, uh, they use a lot of, uh, they are the biggest uh, consumer of coal. If you take industrial sector wise, if you see that. Bio bracket with calorific value somewhere around 4,000 could be the game changer. A Jharkhand produces a lot of hardwood, so it could be one. Designer char could be another one. Bamboo can be utilized. If we are not, if we are able to phase out phosphorus from bamboo, then biofuel in bamboo is going to be the game changer for the Jharkhand. Another issue. Uh, like when we talk about transition, critical mineral is going to be very, very important. Because if you do not do sustainable critical mineral mining, and Jharkhand has all those minerals which are going to be very, very important for energy transition. We have copper, we have graphite, we have aluminium, we have iron. So these are going to be very, very important and we need to develop a sustainable mining plan for these rare earth metals or the metals which are very important. Now graphite, graphene, I think is going to be the another future element. Jharkhand produces, uh, it has the pride to produce highest lag production in the country. And second comes the Chhattisgarh. Graphene from lag is going to be the key for energy transition in if it has to be carbon neutral because a lot of research has taken place a lot of developments are taking place graphene can be produced from lac because lac market has always been fluctuating in international market we've got farmers growing lac they always been suffering but once you convert lac into graphene then they will there will be a value addition and we are the largest producer of graphite in our this graphene lake in our state 
So once we convert graphite into this lac into graphene, that is we India is going to lead that energy transition is going to change the entire ecosystem in that state. Because time is short, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to speak much. Uh, but the key takeaway for Jharkhand and from my side, from provincial government would be, while migrating from fossil-based economy to non-fossil-based economy, provincial states require a lot of hand-holding and support uh, from government of India and from international funding so that it becomes just and it is acceptable to the people. As Mr. Lok Kumarji has also said, making commitment is also, uh, we can make a lot of recommendation and commitment, but it has to be acceptable by the politicians and the people of the state. That is going to be very, very important for any state and handholding. Uh, because I see uh, we do not have a lot of states do not have capacity and capabilities. Uh, those needs to be created within the state. Uh, it could be region specific and regional cooperation like states like Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, regional cooperation will be very, very important for economic development for the entire area because Coal will definitely phase out after a certain time. It will lose its charm because it will become less economically viable. But these states which supplies coal to the country, coal and they meet energy security of the country, how do they develop? Like in Germany, in Rio, what they did, they started economic, accelerated economic development started in those regions. So those kind of interventions infrastructure development in those reasons are required. Uh, that will be enabling provision if it is it comes, that is going to be very, very important. And decentralized planning, uh, that is because states, uh, like if you compare Jharkhand from Chhattisgarh, it is quite different. Only one district produces coal uh, as good as Jharkhand produces coal. The economy of Chhattisgarh may not be that much impacted by transition. So you need to have a state-specific approach. Uh, then transition is going to be acceptable to the people and it is going to be equitable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Ajarastogi ji. This was a very effective presentation and you raised some of the state-level issues very well. So, we have completed the the presentation by all the all the co panelists. Uh, we are running short of time, so we'll take maybe three interventions from the from the participant side. Uh, it could be question, it could be clarification. You could add something. So I will request if yeah, please you can introduce yourself and then make your intervention. Keep it uh, brief and concise. Yeah. Eka Jain, I am uh, from the urban sector. A compliment for very good presentations, very effective presentations, especially Mr. Alok Kumar. You made a, you gave an overview, and I understand it's very difficult when you are an insider to give a, a dispassionate view about what the government is doing and what should be done. Uh, my question is only very brief. You talk that the, the term green hydrogen is being changed to low carbon hydrogen. But IPCC and the COP 26-27 and International Energy Agency, they are using this term. So we need not be conflict conflict with the international practice. Yes. No, we, I completely agree with you. See, G20 is a consensus forum. Even if a single member doesn't agree, then you can't proceed. So India is very proud of its national green hydrogen mission and will continue to promote green hydrogen. But I was telling in the G20, there is not consensus on the word green. So to green, I, I was talking only about the, uh, the G20 working group. The consensus is not there. So be it, no problem. But the beauty of the G20 process is that if you bring consensus, it's going to be very effective, very impactful. 
So let us agree to renewable energy and low carbon. I think it, it completes the everything. And the most important thing I've mentioned, you must have paid the attention. If you are agreeing on a standard, which is like so many kilogram of carbon dioxide per kilogram of hydrogen to be qualified as the low carbon or green, your objectives are met. I think you will, you will agree with me. So we have got some online, this online interventions. I will take one, which is, I'll read. If Nepal is not involved in the discussion of regional energy transition, the sustainable goal of renewable energy and energy efficient not fulfilled. What strategic policies should the developing countries like Nepal should focus for the sustainable development of the region? So this is one, one intervention. I'll only briefly respond. Recently, India has announced a, a long-term power trade agreement with, uh, for, with Nepal for 10,000 megawatt in the next 10 years. It's a very big movement and it will, it will supplement the India's energy transition because if we import hydropower, we will consume the green power and it will also enable the so economic growth of Nepal. So it is not only India will export, it, it might also go to Bangladesh and other countries who are willing. So that, that's the importance of the grid with what uh, Gauri Singh was telling. Want to add anything? No, I, I think it also just brings uh, more to the point of regional integration because small countries will not be able to uh, really move the needle unless they can have uh, aggregation at some level or regional integration with the larger countries. So I think it, it just supplements uh, exactly what, uh, what you've been saying. I will take one last intervention. I have a question. I think, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I am Rajan Varma from NTDC. I am looking after new initiatives. But what I am saying is not pertaining to like uh, NTDC or this. I am giving my independent view. Like when uh, some new technology is there, some startup develops something, but he is not able to scale up or he needs say 10 lakh rupees or 20 lakh rupees. But as government or any other machinery what we have, we are not able to give him right support at the right time. There are many technologies, even in India at this stage, we can produce ethanol from CO2 at 30 rupees per kg. But we cannot order for a single party, which is not having some uh, uh, competition, like two, three minimum vendors are not there. Such things, if started in a starting stage, Maybe some small investment will give so much returns that in one year we can have 10 crores of uh, returns from that scheme still. And it will multiply like anything. So this is, okay. I have given one example, but there are so many. Your your point, yeah. uh, I will only respond by two things. First, up to the board of NTPC to take a call. And no, just I'm not debating. They can always take a, some innovative procurement for budding technologies. Like in uh, power ministry, when we were in power ministry, so we had done a call for the startups. They can demonstrate their concept for application of artificial intelligence in the distribution businesses. And we were happy to, to nurture 17 of those startups. So it is always possible. It is, it is happening all around us. So first thing that this says my name plate, Ministry of Power. I'm not the part of Ministry of Power now. This was just done. So... Uh, <clears throat> This has been a very, very, very interesting discussion, a very effective session. Uh, I have jotted some points, which I'll mention for the consideration of my co-panelists. If you want to drop anything or add anything, then maybe then we can, we can finalize our recommendations for this session. First uh, thing which come up very sharply is the electrification of industrial processes. If we have to promote more of renewable energy in the energy supply. Second, what Ms. Gauri Singh uh, brought out is that all renewable, most of the renewable investment is happening in the areas which are not really the high energy growth areas. So we need to push more, more aggressively the development of renewable energy in those areas which are going to see very rapid energy growth. Like India is trying to grow this 500 gigawatt. Third thing which came up is that grid interconnection is, is going to be very, very important if you want to integrate large quantities of renewable energy in the power system. 
<laughs> otherwise will require huge storage requirements connected is the regional integration which uh, gaurav singh just now mentioned is very important for for a smaller countries to be, to drive their energy transition one thing which came up from the presentation is that like a scotland uh, experiment that countries need to think and set up separate institutions institutional mechanism to take care of this energy transition it should not be left to the energy ministries because energy ministries have a very very focused and one sided view a more comprehensive institution uh, at the government level through a commission or through a ministry is required because this cuts across a lot of other sectors social economic sectors is killing all i also want to place the this paying attention to local content for re supply chain is going to very important as we increase the area the penetration of renewable energy otherwise our greening will lead to a lot of imports which will be have lot of implications for energy security dependence as well as for the for unemployment like we have we had lot of ideas about the potential of biomass uh, or stajar astu was also mentioning the biomass is one area which is like green hydrogen biomass is one area which has potential not only in like for producing power but also for transport as well as for lot of other applications which we need to take up and uh, <clears throat> the last point from my side is the is the hand, hand holding of states and state specific plans are very very important because if you want to take them board acceptance uh, say building up consensus will require what are state specific action plans so these are the some ideas points which came up during discussions which i was jotting down which could be if you all agree in the hall which, which could be our recommendations for for the g20 from this session but i will invite my co panelists my one if you want to add anything and you to add anything this yeah. just uh, i think you captured it very well and and, and and all the key points just just one thing when we are talking about the energy transition and it is going to g20 there will be sort of diverged and this transition should be people centric and and uh, um, i think the western thinking and the global south thinking is a different they are developing the transition from the very different lens uh, that is that is my one point and second point i think it's related to our thing is that is the the financing the transition and and here the technology window and the financial window need to open together and and to make this transition happen at the scale required and where there is a crowd financing could be could be mentioned thank you thank you very much thank you you want to add anything i think uh if we have professor jemski on the with us still virtually if he wants to add anything Yeah, maybe just make one very one very quick uh, point. Uh, the I last speaker yes. mentioned economic yes, uh, diversification. Yes, sorry, you want to add? Uh, it's very nice to hear. You want to add anything about the recommendations from this session to G20? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll just add one one thing. Uh, we we the last speaker talked about the importance of overall economic diversification, and in Scotland, uh, just to say, we talked about that on the commission. uh whether in overall industrial strategy should be developed to frame the just transition plans for sectors and we decided not to recommend that specifically because we thought that government would take so long to produce an overall industrial strategy the individual sectoral plans would be postponed far into the future so if you were turning that into a recommendation is don't let the the best be the enemy of the good and actually try to get on with activities where it's tangible and it's practical to do it okay thank you i think we we have come to the the end of this session i must thanks uh, i must thank all my co panelists and all the participants thank you very much thank you thank you so much panelists for your valuable insights can you please come together for a group picture
Thank you so much. Dear dignitaries, the lunch is served in Elior Hall. Please try to be back by 2.15 so that, so that we have ample time for the next sessions. Thank you so much, everyone.
डॉक्टर गोल डॉक्टर गोल डॉक्टर गोल हेलो uh yes hi dr gold uh, would you like to run your presentation and see if it's uh, working smoothly okay let me just uh turn my camera on sure i can see you um, and i can hear you very well okay good um let me just get the slides on the screen Can you see that okay? Perfect. I can see it. Let me just um, move through a slide or two. Sure. You can maybe try moving? to run run the animation. Yes, perfect. I can see it. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll wait for some time and and uh, then everyone will join in. Okay, so. Yeah, no, so what time is the uh yes what time is the um the next session due to start in about so uh it will uh we are expecting to start in another 20 something minutes 15 minutes okay well look i'll be okay. i'll be i'll stay online so whatever sure. needed. sure all right okay. thank you thanks okay. very much bye -bye. thank you bye bye
May I request all of you to please get seated for the last session. I request all of you to please be seated for the last session. Welcome back everyone. The last and the final session is on policy suggestions to G20. The session will deliberate on the key learnings for a sustainable energy transition from the experiences of the G20 countries. It will suggest strategies and policies for the accelerated energy transition. May I request session chair, Dr. Kirit Parik, chairman Arade to come on the dais. Can we have our co-chair, Mr. Abe Bakre, director general, Bureau of Energy Efficiency. Sir, please come on the dais. I request the session panelists to please be seated. Dr. Rajan Sudesh Ratna, Deputy Head, Senior Economic Affairs Officer, Sub-Regional Office for South and Southwest Asia, UNSCAP. Dr. Vibha Dhavan, Director General Terry.
And we have Dr. Tim Gold, Chief Energy Economist, IEA, who is virtually present with us. Dr. Vibha Dhawan. Yes. Dr. Vibha Dhaban is with us. Can we please give a big round of applause for all of them? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I hope that uh, people are trickling in, but we can begin. <coughs> and uh, uh, since uh, Minakshi Lekhi is not going to be here, I think we will have to merge the, this and the concluding session. So I will not give my inaugural initial address. I will give one at the end. To, to summarize and conclude things. All one can say that in the previous uh, sessions, we learned a lot, many new ideas. And uh, so we have to think about how to go about uh, this, what kind of things can be done. So may I now request Mr. Abhay Bakre, Director General Bureau of Energy Efficiency to give his talk. Me, he had it now on his WhatsApp. So, has he given that? No, no, but can I put it here? Yeah. Can you put it here? Yeah, good afternoon, all, and uh, thank you for inviting me here, Dr. Kirit Parik, uh, Dr. Madam Vibhadavan, Dr. Rajan Ratna, Mr. Tim Gould, uh, I hope he has joined virtually. Dr. Jyoti Parikh, uh, other colleagues from Irade, think tanks, government officials, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first uh, compliment Irade and all other organizers for organizing this uh, T20, G20 dialogue uh, for suggesting the policy measures. And now we are discussing the policies, especially pertaining to the energy transition, or we call it as sustainable energy transition. <clears throat> Not only for the, for the country like India, a developing economy like India, but for the entire world. And as you all know, I'm, I'm sure uh, in the morning you would have dis discussed uh, various aspects of energy transition, the opportunities, the kind of actions happening in different parts of the world on a regional basis, uh, on an energy source basis. 
as a director general bureau of energy efficiency i think some of you are aware that uh, the energy conservation act has been amended in december 22 both the both the houses of parliament passed the legislation and it has been notified from 1st of january now what lies there what was the significance of this amendment in nutshell if i can say that has actually converted this energy conservation into a much larger uh, movement called energy transition and in fact now the the ministry has already uh, given a new title to bureau that's bureau of energy transition because we have been now mandated to set up all kinds of policies programs pertaining to the entire energy transition now why did it happen if we can just uh, start or look back a little uh, uh, ago till 2015 before the paris agreement we always thought energy efficiency to be more on a demand side actions pertaining to energy we didn't have much wider impact of that of course we talk we talked about and even we talk today if we talk about an energy source which is available in the most economical manner or we can say cheapest energy source the energy source which is available in every country irrespective of whether it is a northern part or a southern part or tropical country it's available with every region every topography that's the energy efficiency we can always say gas is available in this part oil is available in this part solar is available here wind is available there and all other parts but energy efficiency available in every country every city and hopefully in every household so that's the difference now coming back to the policies which we have and and this is uh, you can see on the screen uh, i don't know we can use this a qr code or not otherwise i can provide a link so bureau had been working for the last 6 years as a kind of a secretariat for the energy transition working group for g20 last 5 years i attended all the working group meetings all ministerials two times it happened virtually and this is the sixth time that uh, now we are getting our own presidency and what kind of policies we want to put forth and that's where we are going to uh, discuss here that whenever we talk about energy transition as i mentioned post paris agreement the energy efficiency and overall the demand kind demand side management has actually taken a bigger shape the bigger shape because the demands in different sectors in the different parts of the country actually drive positive actions from the supply side now how does it really happen if the government plans for say 10 gigawatt of solar fine we can do it we can put the projects if we want to put 10 uh, instead of uh, 10 gigawatt we want to put another 20 gigawatt we will put another double the money possibly and then again put a solar plant but who is going to buy that who is going to purchase that electricity again then you have to put into so many combinations so many obligations everything the same is the story for each kind of thing we can always produce so many power plant we can produce hydro plants wind plants everything but there has to be an economy or different sectors of the economy who can utilize that electricity you can't just keep on storing and now we are talking about storage but how long you will keep on storage there is a cost to it and every every such situation actually adds the cost to the consumer and always the consumer will try to select the least cost option that's the simple business that's the economy because at the end the consumer has to do his own day to day business he is not bothered about what the country's targets are there he has to have has his he has to have his own targets to save money and do the business so how how do we really shape up the programs and the policies on the demand side that decides how the countries will actually move on the energy transition pathway and these are not the single pathways there are different approaches different pathways as you would have seen in different countries countries like middle east have different pathways the countries in european uh, european commission have different pathways Con developing countries like india china will have different pathways our overall objectives energy transition but at the end uh, when we are trying to push our economy let's remind that in normal case the economy will always drive towards a 
uh, high carbon pathway. Now, unfortunate thing. If the economy itself goes low carbon pathway, we don't have to discuss everything because it will happen automatically. So to bring back economy from a high, high carbon pathway towards low carbon pathway, and that's called is the energy transition. And we need to actually delink the economic growth from our emission growth. And this delink kick is actually happening primarily through energy efficiency, supported by all other kinds of uh, energy sources, like whether it's renewables or biofuels or Vulcan. Now, coming back to the demand side the initiatives, in this year's G20 Energy Working Group, India has been trying to put forth the positive things. We don't want G20 to actually uh, talk about the controversies, talk about the issues which are acceptable to something and not acceptable to something. Instead of that, let's put something positive for the coming decades, for the coming years, whether it's a short term, long term and like that. So on the demand side, we have proposed two major policies. There are different uh, uh, other priorities, which I'm sure in the morning uh, you would have got from different speakers. So when we talk about demand side, we can categorize two things, something which we can achieve by 2030, something we can plan beyond 2030. Now, beyond 2030 is something like uh, hard to await sectors because these are, these are going to be sectors left over if we don't address them, but before 2030, if you if we are putting new steel plants, if we are putting new chemical plants and they come up by 2030 without much changes, then again, we have to live with that another 30 years. The steel plant going to be there for another 30, 40 years. Same is the case for buildings. Fortunately, buildings, we are already moving towards net zero, uh, sustainable habitat, everything. The other thing, as I mentioned, by 2030 is this uh, report, which has been very, very uh, well accepted by all the G20 members, even beyond. And this is something where we are actually picking up our original idea, the original target of SDG 7.3 to double our global energy efficiency improvement. That means what? So if last 10 years we have improved our energy intensity and we call it as maybe the energy use per GDP or whatever we call it, whether it's a sectoral or national or whatever, let's improve by double. So now we have reached to a situation where globally, the energy intensity improvement is happening something around 2.1 to 2.1 2 percent. It was something around two around 2015. We we got it back a little something around back to 1.7. Now, what is the projection by IEA and all the reports? If we want to achieve, and that's what final goal is that whatever net zero we are achieving by 2050 or 2060 or mid-century, whatever we call it, in that the 40% actions will actually come from energy efficiency and demand segment. Now, most of the speakers don't talk about that. How can we neglect something which is going to contribute 40%? I don't know how many of you are aware that whatever India's climate targets, whether it's a 33% or 45%, we are talking, 55% emission reduction is happening from energy efficiency. We all talk about 500 gigawatt, we all talk about uh, 175 gigawatt and everything. But that is still 40 to 44 percent. The 55 percent is coming from energy efficiency, and it's happening across different sectors. And in this book, we have actually presented key policy measures, and all countries are ready to adopt this voluntary action plan. We are converted into a voluntary action plan, and I will sum up with those key pillars of this action plan. The details are available in this book. Here we have picked up five pillars, as I mentioned. First, of course, is the building. The building is something which going to last for 40 to 50 years. So let's start having a targets and which are already proven to improve the efficiency in the building stock itself, both from the positive, uh, passive and active purpose. So we are expecting that at least 50% of new buildings by 2030, if they are built after 2030 or even by 2030 and beyond, they should be almost uh, with minimum uh, energy performance, that's called the building codes, compliant to building codes, and should be more than 50% efficient as per the conventional building stock, which we have been constructing for the last 10 years. It includes all kinds of net zero buildings, green buildings, and entire thing. This is the most impactful uh, strategy and program, which we believe every country can take it forward. The second pillar, industry. Industry has a different category. As I mentioned, there are hard to wet sectors, steel, cement, chemicals, and even we sometimes we talk about all other industries. So hard to wet sector, we are addressing in a different way. 
how to actually promote the uh, key technologies which are yet to be actually proven whether it's a CCUS or whether it's a hydrogen or whatever. But there are many industries where we can actually uh, deploy those available technology. And I'm sure most of you have seen the IA reports that, that all technologies which can be deployed by 2030 to meet the 2030 targets are available. They are all available. They are proven, but except that we are yet to promote the these technology for a scale up. Now, this scale up is not happening, as I mentioned about the business reason that it is not perhaps uh, cheaper for them to actually, and they are happy to actually and deploy the same thing which is available. And that's a high carbon technology. The third thing, and of course, the SME also, they have 40 to 50% potential now. So if they really switch to the newer technology, they are going to save a lot of input cost for their material and of course the energy. The third pillar is transport. I'm sure most of you are aware that when the, uh, from 2005 level and all the targets you are aware, from the 2005 level, when we had our BUR, three in 2016, we saw the country's total absolute emission only increase by something around 90 to 95%. That's good because, and we saved our emission intensity by almost 20%. But the transport sector alone, the total emissions increased by 180%. So can you believe when the country's total emissions have only increased by 90%, our transport sector has increased the emission by 180%. We need to address that. Of course, electric vehicle is there. Uh, there is a, a major transformation happening. But there are many other options available. Fuel efficiency has actually now picked up, and now we are much, much efficient than that. And uh, uh, But of course, the biofuel will also go into major play. Biofuel, now we are here. Perhaps uh, it took more time than what uh, should have been. But now we are having a good trajectory for the biofuels because the availability of raw materials, whether it's uh, a kind of a different biomass sector, that's a strategy. But truly, transport sector is still still a challenge, at least for India. And this is this we are trying to highlight. We have uh, uh, taken the fourth uh, pillar, which is <clears throat> the appliances, LEDs, etc. We are happening, but we are yet to penetrate in terms of cooling. As of now, when we have only eight percent households using cooling or their conditioning a country like India, and now we are putting cooling as a next hard to avoid sector. This is something which we have proposed that let's talk about cooling as a hard to avoid sector. Otherwise, by 2030, by 2035, the way we are worrying about steel, cement, and other things, in 2035 and 2040, we will be more concerned about cooling rather than the steel sector. Because by that time, almost the entire uh, countries around the equator will be uh, having 40, 50% air conditioning, everything which will come up will be always air conditioned. And at that, that time, if we start putting uh, the efficiency parameters, the refrigerant, everything, it will be too late by that time. And the, the most important thing, the kind of enormous demand it will have. Within India, we are going to save almost 120 gigawatt of power installed capacity. We can avoid it if from now onwards under the India Cooling Action Plan, if we follow the trajectory by 2035, 26. So can you imagine the 120 gigawatt of additional power, power capacity can be saved if we start taking actions on the cooling side, which includes different kinds of minimum energy performance, which we are using as a star labeling of it. Uh, the last thing, which is the behavioral change. And we all talk about the life, et cetera. Behavioral change is something which again has a, has a different taste for different countries. Uh, the Western countries have a different understanding of that thing. They believe that it has to be on a policy basis. Whereas in India, that's what movement we have. It is something, the self-realization, the responsible consumption. And this is also something which we have very clearly mentioned that if we don't talk about our own responsibility, there is no point in talking about for the entire nation's energy transition methods, because we are ourselves not serious. Then how can the nation be actually achieving the results? Uh, how do we really achieve finally, I'll try to uh, find that without the finance. Now, it, this is a biggest challenge. While it is difficult, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you want to put a solar plant of 10 gigawatt or 20 gigawatt, we can always get a good finance immediately. Whether we want to put a windmill, we'll get a finance. But if I want to uh, replace air one lakh air conditioners in, in, in Delhi, 
who is going to give me finance? I'm trying for last three years. Nobody's ready to finance it. But they say, no, no, we can't count it. Kiske ghar ja raha hai, kya ho raha hai, kitna saving ho raha hai, we can't say. When I wanted to replace motors for textile, uh, 300 textile handlooms, there was no financer available. Because then we don't know we, how can we measure it, whether it is really working or not working. So these are all things. This is something that which is proven, which is evident, but yet we are unable to get any kind of financial support. This is something that uh, we need to promote. Fortunately, government has recently given go ahead for us. We are trying to come up with a big, in, uh, a big scheme on interest subvention when we can actually uh, take up the bottom up uh, financial investment. And can you believe there is a potential of 13 lakh crore in energy efficiency alone from now onwards up to 2030. Even if we tap 10% of that, and all the financial institutions, most of them are sitting on cash or uh, finances and capital. If they can even uh, reap 10 or 15%, it will be a big boost to all kinds of technologies, energy efficiency, and it will also benefit SMEs, buildings, and everything. Once again, thank you so much for inviting me. And I request you to have a, a look of this book. Uh, I don't have many hard copies, but uh, I can always provide you a link. You can download it. Thank you so much. Namaskar Jain. Thank you, Mr. Bakare. I think uh, uh, he has understood, he has underscored one of the most important point, energy efficiency, uh, and how we can go about improving that. I think the next uh, speaker I would invite is uh, Dr. Rajan Sudesh Ratna, who is uh, in the ESCAP office, Deputy Head and Senior Economic Affairs Officer, Sub-Regional Office of ESCAP, UNESCO. So please, Mr. Ratna. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parekh. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the hosts uh, for inviting me, giving us the opportunity uh, to be here. It's also indeed a privilege as an institution of ESCAP because we are the knowledge partner for G20 Energy Working Group with the Ministry of Power and we are working on some of the priority areas. So um, I would also share those. So I, we, have, I mean, we are given an opportunity to share those. Uh, this session for me is very challenging because in the morning we discussed all plethora of issues and now we talked about energy efficiency. And beyond that, there is a fatigue of a heavy lunch. Um, so we are so much surplus with the energy among ourselves um, that when we talk about energy transition, uh, it becomes very, very challenging. Uh, however, it, it's a part of a duty. So uh, let me, uh, but I avoid some of these things and mostly uh, I would pick up from what Mr. Alok Kumar said about those priority areas or issues which have been identified for G20. Um, if we really need to look into the policy imperatives, uh, this India's presidency or a leadership for the G20 uh, is, could be a little game changer because in many of the working groups, and we are, uh, ASCAP is participating in other working groups as well, what they are trying is to develop some kind of a global framework or architecture coming out of these T20 meetings, ministerial declarations and others. Of course, by default, the declarations uh, of G20 are not binding in nature. Uh, if you do some past uh, uh, literature survey, you will find many of these declarations which came out. Uh, we are never implemented by G20 countries themselves. That's a reality. And therefore, if a framework on an architecture, global architecture, which can be developed under the India's presidency uh, in many or any other working groups, that would be remarkable and a game changer. And that is what I think is being planned in, in the energy working group. Uh, when we look into the, the transition, and definitely uh, G20 is the core in terms of energy, as well as 
uh, very important for any transition uh, in view of the fact that um, in the morning though we talked about, but I want to highlight coming from UN, the importance for sustainable development goals and especially goal seven, which is linked with energy. Uh, globally, if you look at, uh, the whole world is regressing on various targets of SDG seven. Uh, even if you look into South Asia with the area which we are looking into, except for access to electricity, which is target 7.1.1, which has done much better than uh, all other targets and is above the target of 2022 as per the data available, all other targets of SDG 7, we are lagging behind. In fact, it is... Uh, uh, when we talk about energy transition or we talk about sustainable energy, um, one cannot ignore that the target 7.1.2, which talks about reliance on clean energy, the target 7B1, which is about the renewable electricity per capita capacity, we are far, far behind the target of 2022. And of, on icing on the I mean, uh, uh, on the cake is that the goal seven point, I mean, the target 7.2.1, which is renewable energy sale in the uh, share in the energy mix, is going in the negative direction. So while the demand of energy is increasing, investment in energy is also increasing. It's not that it is not, in, not increasing, but the key is that the share of renewable energy in that is declining. For the world, it is slightly constant, but for, for us in South Asia, it's negative. And um, I can share, um, the total energy consumption has fallen from around 60% in 1990 to less than 40% by 2022. And that's for South Asia. And we know in South Asia, Bhutan and Nepal are mostly into hydroelectricity. So this pulling down effect is by the countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, which are high energy demand. And therefore, India has a dual role to play. While it is going to play an important role as a presidency in G20 in energy, it also needs to lead the way uh, in terms of this uh, transition. And for these transition, uh, there are many issues which have been discussed and we talked about solar, we talk about um, hydroelectricity, wind, thermal, energy efficiency. The recent talk on, and there was some mention in the morning also, and uh, Mr. Alok pointed out about that dichotomy in the discussion in the G20 is about the hydrogen energy and what is green, what is gray. And that is also an, an issue which Perhaps if G20 could, could do something or, or, or bring as a policy imperative or build a standard into that what he was hinting at uh, would be remarkable because that is very, very important. The other thing uh, uh, which I would like to uh, mention about and was discussed in a previous section uh, uh, by uh, the chief uh, advisor or something for the Jharkhand, Mr. Rastogi, uh, on a critical raw material. That is equally important because this extraction is unevenly distributed worldwide. And if you look into the G20, G20 are the producers and G20 are also the major seeker of the critical raw materials. And there are certain good lessons which have been done in terms of the CRM, which is a critical raw material supply chain, which is one of the priority issues in the G20. Uh, Australia, China, and Turkey have uh, established some good practices in terms of the supply chain. And that is what needs to be, to be brought in. In the G20, I, 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 I think the principle for collaboration on critical minerals which is being discussed and debated. I, I didn't find any mention in, in Mr. Alok's presentation, but the another imperative is that if G20 can come out to address something on this, 
it would be uh, again very very uh, important uh, in terms of uh, connectivity and especially energy um, we have been discussing uh, cross border electricity trade is an imperative um, we cannot ignore the fact that energy as a commodity to be traded will continue it's important will continue whether it is renewable or non renewable but it will continue because the self sufficiency in energy is a distance dream and for that we talked about transnational grid we talked about but uh, if there could be some regulatory framework which can be discussed because each country and even country like india different states have different electricity boards who have their different regulatory mechanisms the discoms so uh, at a state level at a central level at a country level cross border country level there are a lot of uh, issues um in fact escap had uh, uh, a resolution which was agreed by all the countries in asia and pacific on regional road map to power system connectivity uh, and it prescribed uh, uh, certain visions and principles and uh, nine strategies for enabling uh, these and some of these are included in the g20 uh, we hope that they would be uh would be coming out in 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 some of them uh but what is important in 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 terms of the cross border given the countries at different levels and it, it is a global issue uh given the difference in the countries level of development many capacity building awareness policy advisory in terms of what kind of regulatory mechanism are required in these countries would be very very important then again we have to look from the countries and i can again give you an example of south asia uh how uh, and we talked in the morning how ukraine russia war led to rising fuel prices globally and we have seen what happened in sri lanka i have seen personally what is happening in maldives uh they island countries have a different challenge so when we are looking into these imperatives coming out from the g20 certain uh, policy imperatives for these countries which are land locked or island also need to be taken into consideration because when you talk about uh, transmission of electricity from one country to another country and especially if the country is in island or the country which has pacific has hundreds of atolls or a maldives which has hundreds of atolls you cannot talk about uh, 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 energy transmission so you need to have a local solutions you need to have some kind of a local um, policy imperatives which can Uh, help what i found uh, and not surprising uh, but still i would like to state though i know in the g20 it is not going to be agreed to is the issue of technology we talk a lot about financing in terms of climate change in terms of energy and other things but very little is being talked about the technology Uh, one of the priority areas in india g20 has been there but i don't see anything coming out of it but when you talk about creating energy efficiency when you talk about sustainable energy transition when you talk about digitization you require a technology and without that i think uh, any policy suggestion uh, or a global consensus it would be very very uh um, distant dream to really go for a successful energy transition thank you very much i think mr tim gold from iea is on the online and i request him to join the please make his presentation mr dr tim gold well thank you very much indeed um Mr. Chen, Dr. Parikh, it's a great pleasure to join you all uh, today from Paris, from the headquarters of the International 
Energy Agency. I hope you can uh, you can hear me okay. Um, what I'd like to do uh, today, I'm just going to share um, my screen uh, and put some slides up for you, um, where I talk through one of the issues that we think is absolutely critical to this discussion, um, and that is the the topic of uh, investment. Um, we've had very strong engagement with the um, with the G20 presidency um, uh, of India, uh, and uh, I take this opportunity to express my sincere compliments on the way that India has managed to cover so much ground and the way they've navigated this uh, this uh, this this agenda. Um, one of the most recent opportunities was at the G20. Uh, development ministers meeting where our executive director participated. Um, he spoke about many things. He spoke about the life initiative, which has already been mentioned. Um, he spoke about the imp importance of energy efficiency. And I can only uh, agree with the words earlier from our distinguished uh, representative for the Bureau of Energy Efficiency on the importance of that demand side aspect and the importance of this initiative to try and double the rate of energy efficiency and improvement through to 2030. And we, we fully, fully support that and, and very much welcome the focus on that. Um, and the other issue that the executive director really pushed um, during that um, development ministers meeting um, was this question about investment, about finance, um, about what it would take to try and, and move um, clean energy investment uh, much more strongly. And the reason why we think it's so important, um, I, I would like to talk to just talk through with you, uh, with you now, um, because at the IEA, we try and track different aspects of capital flows into the energy sector. Um, and this is the picture that we see. Um, this is uh, history back from 2019. Um, but it includes also our first estimate of global spending on different bits of the energy sector in 2023. Fuel supply investment still looks more traditional, shall we say, um, but I think it's quite striking to note that um, of all of the different bits of the energy system, one of the very few elements where investment has yet to reach the levels of 2019 is in upstream oil and gas. Uh, and that's despite those record revenues that accrued to the oil and gas industry um, last year during, during the energy crisis. And I think that already tells us something uh, about the uncertainties that the industry faces uh, when it looks at the future uh, of, uh, of fossil fuel demand uh, in particular, as it relates to large capital intensive long term uh, upstream projects. I think the other point to note, we've had a lot of interesting exchanges today also on different aspects of low emission fuels, hydrogen, biogases, biofuels. And um, that is starting to rise now in our view globally, but you can see it's rising uh, from a very low base. If we shift our perspective across to um, the power sector, um, you already see quite a sharp contrast there. 90% um, of the investment in generation is already going into low emission sources, mainly renewables, um, but also nuclear. And I think the main theme here that I'll come back to in a second is this notion of clean electrification, which encompasses not just the generation side, but also um, in some countries, enhanced investments in modernized and smart grids and storage, uh, but then also the demand component of a more electrified system with uh, electric mobility, efficient cooling, um, and uh, electrified heat uh, in, in many countries. Um, but a word of warning, uh, you can see the electrification piece rising quite well. Um, but I think we really need to have our eye on the ball when it comes to uh, the efficiency side. Um, efficiency spending is affected by higher borrowing costs, strains on household finances, strains on, on, uh, on some aspects of industry finances. Uh, and so we are not seeing that rapid increase 
in efficiency investment um, that we very much need to in order to get on track for sustainable development goals and uh, for uh, our broader Paris Agreement uh, targets. And so I think, uh, you know, a first point is to very strongly agree with the emphasis already in this session on pushing that efficiency agenda also uh, through, the, uh, through the G20. I'd like to step back a bit and look at what this means then for the relative positioning of investments in more traditional fossil fuel areas and investments in clean energy transitions, by which we don't just mean renewable power, we include under clean energy here uh, also infrastructure, so grids and storage, clean fuels, um, and also uh, efficiency spending as well. And if we cast our minds back a few years, um, there was rough parity between the amount of money going into fossil fuels and the amount of money going into what you might call um, clean energy transition related uh, spending. And we were worried at this picture because in a world of rising demand for energy services and that huge development agenda, which is rightly focused uh, of many speakers today, um, we were simply not putting enough capital into the global energy sector. We weren't putting enough to change direction, but we also, in the absence of that surge in clean energy spending, we weren't putting enough into the good functioning of the uh, existing system. And then if we, if we fast forward now to the present, um, the amount of capital going into fossil fuel supply um, took a dip with the pandemic in 2020, but it's basically back to uh, where it was. Um, but we have seen quite a noticeable acceleration in the amount of capital going to clean energy transition. So we've broken that log jam, and it's clearly good news, um, but there are a couple of very important nuances that um, I would like to bring to your attention. And when we break down that trend in global clean energy spending by region, um, you'll immediately see where uh, the issue is. A lot of the dynamism has been coming from advanced economies where you've had that surge in also in supporting policies uh, in, in the US and, and parts of Europe and elsewhere. Um, but if you take out China as well, then you know, you, you, you immediately see that in the bulk of emerging and developing economies, which account for some two thirds of the world's population, you're only seeing around 15% of the global total for uh, clean energy uh, investment. Of course, there are bright spots in many parts of that emerging developing picture. I mean, solar in India, efficiency spending in India are two very good examples, but you can also see positive trends in renewables uh, investment in Brazil and some other parts of Latin America. And, perhaps boosted by the, um, the record revenues last year. Uh, you've also got some emerging dynamism in parts of the Middle East also for, uh, for clean, energy, uh, clean energy projects. But the overall picture, I think, is quite uh, a sobering one. And there's no simple reason that you can point to to explain why we have yet to see that uh, clean energy investment uh, picking up. Um, the economics are, in many cases, strong, but there are different headwinds um, that prevent some of these projects from go ahead. Some of them are, are very broad macro considerations, like rising borrowing costs, which of course discriminate against technologies that have large upfront expenditures. And that's certainly the case for many clean energy technologies. But there's also a host of very sector and, and project specific issues, um, issues like grids, credit worthiness of the uptakers for renewable power, land acquisition. And we've seen, we've seen also in India that there are many ways in which some of these issues can be addressed. Um, setting up the Solar Energy Corporation of India was, was very helpful in, in assuaging concerns um, about the uh, reliability of the of the off taker and indeed India's example in that respect has been one that's been followed by other countries Cam countries like Cambodia have looked 
to similar ways of, of preparing the ground for investments in renewable uh, power, um, also by looking after the land for projects and, and looking after um, the grid connections. So there are different pro problems, different risks that can affect uh, projects in different environments, but a common denominator is that they all push up the cost of capital. And the cost of capital for a clean energy project in many parts uh, of the emerging developing economies outside China is about two or three times higher uh, than it is in uh, advanced economies. And that will, of course, need to change. Uh, and one of the outcomes of the recent um, summit on a new global financing pact, which took place here in Paris, was a task for the International Energy Agency to produce analysis and recommendations on how to bring down the cost of capital uh, for clean energy projects in emerging and developing economies, building on some work that we did jointly with the International Finance Corporation. And we'll need to, to make rapid progress on that, because if we are to reach our sustainable development goals, if we are to reach um, the ambitious end of the Paris Agreement targets, um, you will need to see a sevenfold increase in, in, in clean energy investment in emerging developing economies um, over the next 10 years. Um, and you can see from this chart that you really need those increases across the board. It's, it's, a, it's also about low emission power, but grids and storage, the demand side component, very, very important as well. And then low emission fuels also need to come in to, to address many of the issues that have been discussed already in our, uh, in, in our discussions today. Um, and then the geographical split, um, you know, the needs are spread very widely across different parts of the world. Um, and, and India is, of course, a big part of that. But I think, you know, Africa needs to be very much in our minds as one of the regions that has that needs to see the very largest uh, increases compared with today. Um, it's been emphasized previously by other speakers. Um, but we do believe that all sources of finance need to expand in order to get us close to where we need to be. Um, that's public, private, concessional, non-concessional, domestic, international. No one source will be able to do it alone. Um, but it is the case that in emerging developing economies, um, clean energy investments tend to be much more dependent on public sources uh, of finance than at advanced economies. That's around half of the clean energy investment is dependent on public sources in emerging developing economies compared with around 20% in advanced economies. Um, and then the largest increase, though, in our view, would need to take place uh, from that private financing. And, and then some analysis that we've done recently talks through what that agenda for change looks like to scale up uh, private financing. This is the joint work that I mentioned uh, with the uh, International Finance Corporation. And of course, there's a large policy component to this, and we've discussed some of those aspects today. I would emphasize also the need for investments in institutions, in capacity, in the ministries, in the regulators, and, and, the, and, and the ability of utilities to function uh, as well as they can, because that is a very, very important part of the picture. And we sometimes get over focus on just on the policy angle there and don't pick up the institutional angle as much as we should. Um, we need significantly greater quantities of concessional finance. Uh, and one of the features of the work that we just completed was that we put a number on that. So in our view, we would need to have around 80 to $100 billion each year of concessional funding to get those investments moving. Um, I should emphasize that not every clean energy project needs uh, concessional finance, um, but there is a case where newer technologies are evolved, um, you know, such as battery storage in some cases or low emission hydrogen, or in new markets with higher levels of country risk, um, where you just need an additional push to get uh, to get projects moving, to get momentum, to, 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 to get higher confidence from, from different actors. For the moment, um, the record uh, on blended finance um, is really not great. If you look at the numbers that are prepared by our OECD colleagues, 
for um, international climate finance, you'll see that if you put together the different categories of energy, industry, and transport, the public international finance coming through uh, in the most recent year that they record is around $30 uh, billion. Um, and then the estimate for the amount of private finance mobilized by that 30 billion is around 9 billion. So the record is for every dollar of public money, you generate an additional 30 cents or so of private money. Um, that is not what we need to see. We need to see that ratio uh, transformed into, I mean, you can take your pick, three, four, five, six, seven to one um, in order to mobilize much greater sources of private financing uh, for every uh, dollar of, of, of public money that's brought in. And, and that means focusing less on perhaps direct project funding, but more on de-risking than private uh, investments. Another point that we emphasized was the need for new financing instruments and platforms. Um, there are a number of quite promising areas um, that are out there, um, but all of them have yet to really take off, particularly emerging and developing uh, economies. Um, carbon markets is a good example where we do need much more attention to the transparency and monitoring um, to, to ensure the integrity and credibility of, uh, of these markets. Um, but there is a, a significant opportunity here. Uh, for example, at the moment, there's roughly 2.5 trillion in ESG-related investment funds, uh, but hardly any of that capital today finds its way to emerging developing economies. We need to think more creatively about the mechanisms, the platforms, the aggregators that can enable some of that capital to flow. And finally, um, deeper local capital markets uh, and final census. So we have to focus also on that domestic angle. And certainly a country like India is a very good example of, of how domestic capital can be mobilized for um, clean energy projects. But I think the sorts of ex the sorts of leadership that India has shown there um, needs to be more widely uh, sh uh, shared and, and emulated uh, uh, across um, across other countries. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I will leave it there. Um, our key message is today's energy world is is moving quite quickly, and a new clean energy economy is emerging. It's emerging more quickly than many people think. Um, but it is emerging in a way that is uneven. And that I suppose our key um, hope from the Indian G20 presidency, and, and this has already been a, a big focus, is that we can find more ways to bridge that emerging gap that we're seeing in uh, capital flows uh, to clean energy transitions around the world. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Uh, may I now request Dr. Viva Dhawan, Director General of TERI, uh, for her speech. Thank you so much. In fact, I haven't prepared a structured presentation largely because there are so many other presenters and it really becomes difficult because more or less everything is said. But let me try to put, I, I should say, what have been discussed in little bit different terms. It was very rightly mentioned that uh, by uh, Mr. Bhakre about the new energy conservation bill and the amendments it has brought up. Because it's not just energy efficiency, it is that we are living in a different world today where the technology development is much faster than what we have expected. And the other is that we really, we are not looking at white good or appliances or which consume direct energy. We also have to look into the buildings. This particular room, is it energy efficient? The entire building of the hotel, is it energy efficient? And we'll say the answer to that definitely is no. And what can they do about it? Should we bring out regulations that part of their energy requirements they have to meet from the renewable energy sources? Are there opportunities available that the existing infrastructure can also be made more energy efficient? 
And we'll say that the answer to that is yes, it is possible. Now, few uh, corporates, few hotels, houses, they would like to go in the voluntary way. They'll say, why not to adopt it? We also have a responsibility. But somewhere, maybe government will also have to put regulations in place. And that is what the Energy Conservation Bill, at least for the new infrastructure, they have uh, brought into uh, existence, but perhaps it can also be done for the old infrastructure which exists because it's everyone's responsibility. The other thing which I always in a way I feel why not and that is when we are talking of solar rooftop for such a long time, but still it is not a reality. What is it that's keeping us away from such a wonderful technology that generate your own energy. And somewhere I'll also put it that, are we to be blamed or the systems as a whole are to be blamed? To a consumer today putting a solar rooftop is, I'm perhaps sacrificing my roof because during winters, I may not have the kind of sunlight I otherwise enjoy. And what is there for me? It is. What will be the saving like 5,000, 10,000 rupees a month? It's not much. And in any case, I'm initially putting an investment of three to five lakhs. So that is where the calculation goes wrong. We really have to put it in a way that here is a solar rooftop because the country requires it. And what we are saying, instead of the saving of 10,000, we are saying, okay, you, you will get the saving of 5,000 a month right from day one. So therefore, without making any investment, they are getting savings. So they will sacrifice their rooftop. And you are recovering, like you say, that payback period is three years. Maybe for first six years, seven years, you are saying we are only giving you 50% of the electricity that your solar rooftop is generating. So you recover the cost and at the same time, buyer or the client is very happy because they are getting returns. Now, when we talk of energy transition, it has different meaning for different stakeholders. And it is something which is taking place, I'll say ever since we are born. I, if I remember correctly in our families, there used to be a Giti and we used to build, uh, burn coal directly. Then came the LPG. And again, the choice made was that, okay, it's convenient, but it's expensive. So in the morning and evening, you'll still have Angiti, but at the, for your convenience, you'll have LPG. And that is what is happening today in the rural India. For them, energy transition is access to clean energy and convenient energy. For a corporate, it is again that can I save money? And then, of course, depending on your scale, you're also looking towards, am I becoming green? And that greening essentially helps them to have better image in the outside world and therefore have more of with this. And ESG reporting is one important step which has been introduced because otherwise many of these things, they go unnoticed. So the moment you have to report, you'll actually look into what am I doing, your own doings, can I improve upon them further? Now, climate change, and most of the time, if you ask young children, and I do it quite frequently, and the answer is, I, I, and first I ask them, do you think our generation was very irresponsible? And the answer I get is yes. Are you responsible or you are better than us? then also the answer is yes. But really, and what is the reason for climate change? And the answer given is, it's the industrialized countries. And because of industrialization in those countries, we are suffering. Now that is a wrong answer. Because if industrialization has taken place, it's each one of us who has got benefited because of that. They are, we all are enjoying the fruits of industrialization. So let's not blame industrialization. And to me, they have done best to their capacity at that stage.
to develop the product to make human life better on this planet. And definitely the side or the negative impact, like when we take any allopathic medicine, they say there is going to be some side effect. And that side effect has been the changing climate. We were warned much in advance that this development is not sustainable, but we preferred to ignore that particular aspect of it. And we continued on that path. Now, definitely it has been recognized that development can has to take place, but it can be far more sustainable. And I take India uh, as a country where we also have an opportunity because whether it is infrastructure, whether it is industry, we have the opportunity to develop it green and show the way to the world that how development can be green. It's also a sort of a myth that greener is expensive. Yes, we require capex and that is where we have to find a way out. We require technologies like today, most of the technologies, they are in a way uh, not available to the developing part of the world. IPRs have become far more important than our future perhaps. So therefore technology uh, sharing is not free. And I'll put it this way that it is not just that we require the technology, we need to co-develop the technology. The size of our industry is much is very different from what is there in the developed part of the world. Maybe we don't even require that level of technology sophistication. We can stop much earlier. And the important part is that we must ensure that whatever technology we are talking about, the green technologies, they are made available to small and medium enterprises. That is where 60% of the production in the country takes place. So you cannot ignore them. And therefore you have to ensure that you develop technologies for them as well. And co-development of the technology, gone are the days when we used to say that US is much advanced compared to India. We are as advanced, it is even in those countries, it's our Indian brains which are developing the technologies. So we can do much better in our own country and develop the technologies. Now let's look into where the gaps are. Now, according to me, one of the biggest gap is we all love to work in silos. So whether it is when we talk of the uh, energy, it is with so many, or energy environment, there are so many ministries who are working in silos. Coal is different than MNRE, than MOEF, but then petroleum. So therefore they all try to develop their own roadmaps while we need to develop one particular roadmap and look into every aspect of it. Now, let me take example of electric vehicles. Great technology. Have we done the life cycle analysis? For whom it really suits? Is it for everyone, even for a person who does just 10 kilometers of running a day, if your office is five, six kilometers and you largely go to your office, then is EV the solution? You talk of EV infrastructure, talk of EV batteries, do the entire life cycle analysis before promoting a technology. But what we have done is there is scraping policy for the vehicles, the best of the vehicles, which have hardly run may, may not be even one lakh kilometers. And you, you again want to invest in another vehicle, which will do another one lakh in 10 years. So your entire GHG emissions, which you will be saving by burning the way of the petrol or the savings in efficient fuel, they are actually going in manufacturing of the vehicle itself. So therefore, we need to work out the entire LCAs and go for it. Similarly, another example I would like to take is that of biomass. Biomass is what? It is fixation of carbon dioxide. Uh, and therefore, more biomass you produce, you're fixing more of carbon dioxide. 
Why are we worried about burning the biomass? And yes, there are better technologies available. Now, burning the biomass, and again, a classical example that why the Parali had become a problem in last few years, which was not a problem earlier. Now, it was that the cultivation time, rice was sown in the month of May, usually, April, May. And because water, especially in the Punjab region, became a problem, it became the sowing date is actually announced by the government year after year, depending on the arrival of the monsoon. The plant requires certain almost three months to mature and the, uh, rather four months. So therefore the harvesting time of rice had become late October to early November. Most of the varieties of rice must or wheat must be sown by 15th of November. So there is a very short window available to the farmer to prepare his field for the next crop that is wheat. And therefore, they have no time to collect this biomass, they simply burn it in the field. So because the water department, irrigation department worked independently of the agriculture, looking at varieties, it was that we have started burning the biomass directly in the field. But if we look at biomass is that you're fixing sun's energy, carbon dioxide, which can be used as a fuel. And that is what we are trying to achieve through bio, biofuels and the uh, compressed CNG, we, uh, have these uh, biogas plants and so on. So it's a good initiative. And I suppose that should be encouraged if you look at the environmental burden as well uh, in this particular thing. Now, the other is, Let's not have policies that you are simply forcing that so much of biomass pellets are to be used and therefore at whatever price they are available, because that is a sure way of killing the technology because you are forcing some of them. Now, last point I'll come to, and that is uh, the G20. As I said earlier, perhaps one of the main messages that should come out is that the technology co-sharing is very important if we want to save this planet. And so is co-development of the technologies. We must look at the issues which are also emerging at the global level. And I'll take, again take one example. And that is, if you look at the shipping, <coughs> ships are Im extremely important for trade but then they go from one continent to the other and therefore the level or the uh, quality of fuel which is burnt in those ships become very critical regulations uh, they are going to come in place and of course Europe is already working on in developing regulations related to carbon tax so over there, we should be very sensitive towards that, what are countries like G20 countries doing in that direction, so that they also remain competitive in years to come. And again, I like to compliment comment because there is one project which Terry is, all, is involved in, and that is setting up of National Center of Excellence on green ports and shipping. So where we are looking at every possibility of even making the port green and what kind of trucks will come and take the freight further and so on. And perhaps G20 should also come out with uh, a sort of coordinating uh, coordination in research efforts among these countries and learn from each other's experience. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zaman, for a very interesting speech. May I now request uh, Neetu Mathur. She is with Niti Ayo, used to be earlier working at Terry, did lots of work in modeling and other things. So, Dr. Neetu Mathur. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parikh, and uh, thanks to the organizers for having me here. Uh, so, I mean, we are at the fag end of this uh, panel, and 
not too much left for me to uh, make as uh, new points, but I will try to uh, collate uh, much of what we've heard and throw in some of my own uh, thinking as well in terms of the challenges and opportunities we have uh, in the energy transition. So uh, uh, also at the outset, let me clarify that my views uh, sh should not be taken as Niti Aayog's official views, uh, but um, uh, we have already heard uh, in terms of uh, the energy transition uh, being a very complex process uh, and uh, integrating many uh, facets such as energy security, affordability, sustainability in its realm while we are uh, looking at how to go ahead. Now, as per some of the internal analysis that we've done at Niti Aayog, if we start looking at the very broad direction of moving towards net zero, going all the way till 2070, we are at about 83% fossil dependency in 2020, and we would need to more or less reverse this share and get to about at least 85% non-fossil by 2070. So broad direction-wise, we also heard through the day uh, what all we need to do. And the picture is fairly clear. We are all aware of energy efficiency uh, needing to play a very important role and having a large part of uh, the story that uh, it can help uh, address, but also the need for cleaner alternatives, uh, some of which exist and some of which remain to become commercially viable, uh, needing to uh, fill in the story uh, during the short, medium, long-term transition as we go along. So there is therefore no single bullet or there is not a clear path that we can today chart out very clearly. We heard in the morning also the need for roadmaps, detailed roadmaps. Are we in a position to do that detailed roadmap today and now? I would say no, but at the same time, I think the need to have a blueprint of where we need to go and providing some kind of a direction to create the awareness of uh, where is it that we are headed, what are the key things in our kitty that we need to move along with, and at what time frames are we looking at certain, uh, certain big moves. I think that is uh, probably more important. The second point that I wanted to bring in there is in looking at this planning, in looking at this formulation, uh, the need also becomes very varied in terms of what you need to do in different regional or subnational uh, contexts. The local level challenges are very different. We may want to do in, uh, an increase in RE, but are each of the states equally uh, able to move towards the RPOs that we have? What are the challenges that they face? Uh, what are the uh, opportunities that they have? These differ depending on the local context. It de de differs depending on the kind of section of society we are talking about. So again, bringing in the contextualization and understanding uh, the local context, fine tuning our answers and solutions uh, to uh, address those in the short term is, uh, I think, a, a very important ingredient in moving ahead with our energy transition. Uh, I did mention that, uh, you know, we need all kinds of things in our kitty. So, I mean, energy efficiency is one of the important ones. Renewable energy is something which uh, is a no-brainer. But again, it's not that these uh, options together can solve all the, uh, all, all the challenges. Uh, uh, even after electrification, there are lots of uh, hard to abate sectors which remain. And for these, we are talking about green hydrogen, et cetera. So again, in the morning, we heard uh, the, the six key areas that G20 has now singled out as technology. I think it's important to single out uh, some elements that we definitely want to focus on uh, uh, from a viewpoint of being able to channelize the financing towards that in terms of being able to create the awareness that we need to uh, put in a greater thrust in the shorter term towards uh, these, uh, these uh, alternatives. Having said that, I think, again, the point that I would like to make is we need to be flexible enough because there, over time, there will be uh, uh, new uh, evolutions, new solutions that might emerge. And therefore, again, 
uh, by no means should we cement ourselves into uh, uh, into um, uh, only a few options, not leaving flexibility uh, to um, to change tracks uh, over time in the medium to long term. So uh, one of the things we also therefore need is strengthening the data spine to conduct deep dives across various aspects, whether these are social, uh, economic, technological aspects, etc. So again, uh, how good is our data? How good are our frameworks? How good are our capacities, uh, at, say at the subnational levels, to understand who uses what, who can use what? who has what kind of affordability, what kind of change can be made such that the person is able to move or make a shift from the current uses to the next use. I think these are all step changes that again require uh, us to do deep dives and look at uh, the nitty gritties uh, of uh, the challenges uh, for various specific sectors as we go along. We also heard about just transition, and that I think is the key center stage for a country like India uh, in terms of uh, looking at uh, how we must think uh, about the energy transition. Uh, uh, again, coal and uh, its use is not going to go away uh, anytime in the near future. Uh, according to a study, about 21.5 million people working in fossil fuel and dependent industries uh, are likely to be impacted by the transition. So carrying along the people, looking at the challenges which face the transition, uh, looking at what would happen to the uh, revenue which is generated in the coal-rich states, looking at uh, what it means in terms of the revenues to the government, all of these are important elements of uh, looking at the challenges in our uh, transition story. And again, India's fossil fuel industry is concentrated in about 120 districts in the country. And some of the districts that face the greatest challenges in clean energy transitions are also uh, the ones which have uh, the highest proportion of uh, BPL population. So again, looking at how do we carry uh, this, these sections of society along? What do we do in terms of creating um, uh, jobs and livelihoods uh, uh, and alternative opportunities to the people um, in terms of uh, uh, being uh, uh, appropriate uh, opportunities is, uh, is again important. We also heard about the finance requirements as being extremely important. And I would completely agree uh, that India uh, needs to uh, pump up the amount of uh, money flow to get things going um, and allowing for rapid development and leapfrogging uh, not only for our own country, but for the developing world as a whole. Uh, and therefore, again, the G20 agenda, I think, must definitely push uh, a lot more uh, for uh, towards paid up capital by the multilateral development banks and uh, trying to uh, uh, highlight the voice of the global south to strongly push for enhancing the uh, flow of funds to fuel the development needs uh, of the global south. Uh, integrated planning structures, again, I think was uh, mentioned uh, uh, during uh, the panel. And uh, again, capacities, of course, need to be created. But in the energy transition, uh, it would be extremely important to look at not, uh, the, not a change in one sector vis-a-vis -vis another or one uh, set of people vis-a-vis -vis another or a technology and so on, but over uh, an integrated dimension, not only across sectors, uh, but across uh, uh, different resources and the implications that a change in energy, a change in material, a change in land, a change in water use, et cetera, could have. And therefore looking at uh, the overall resource efficiency, I would say is equally important when we are looking at an energy transition rather than looking at one sector uh, of energy uh, as a standalone and at some other point starting to worry about what happens with land or water or air. Um, another point that I did want to bring in and reiterate uh, is about the regional integration. And here again, I think there can be uh, opportunities that uh, we can uh, use uh, to uh, not only lead the Global South, but also to enhance the opportunities that we have for using and enabling 
uh, greater uh, adoption of clean energy uh, technologies. So building collective capacities, collective infrastructure and uh, use of technologies would be extremely important. Uh, equally important would be uh, looking at uh, setting standards or um, uh, codes uh, which can provide the directional kind of reach um, uh, in the long term, but also looking at how to overcome the challenges in the local context and in the short term to reach towards those larger directional uh, goals. Uh, and finally, to end, I would say, uh, again, from a uh, end use side, uh, uh, we have the mission life and uh, the, uh, the move to look towards uh, frugal consumption, not only within the country, but uh, uh, for the world as a whole. Uh, but here again, I think it is extremely important uh, to see that this in a way that as we transition, we choose ways by which we uh, don't get into a use and throw kind of society, but can do the most in terms of uh, being able to uh, look at uh, the usage in an entire life cycle uh, kind, kind of a, a manner, also from a point of view of affordability uh, and also from the point of uh, efficiency. So um, uh, therefore, I think uh, more or less, uh, we have a number of challenges. It is by no means an easy task, but uh, I think if we uh, go about it in terms of uh, using the correct technologies, but also planning uh, and putting forward our policies in a manner that helps make the entire environment conducive uh, to the change, be it for the end use consumer, be it for the manufacturer, or be it for uh, the, uh, the uh, people who are likely to make uh, the finance available. I think policy has a great role to play uh, in uh, providing the correct uh, signals, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, providing uh, an impetus to private sector uh, participation, or whether it is in terms of uh, creating incentives for people to uh, enhance uh, uh, cleaner production and so on. So uh, with that, I think I'll end for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ritu. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I will have to conclude observations and then we can vote for vote of thanks. Bye. I think I must uh, thank all of you for staying here till the last session. Usually we consider that a conference is successful if the presence in the last section is at least 50% of the presence in the first session. At least now we have about 66%. And therefore I think, thank you all for making this a successful conference. Uh, I think what we have learned today is a few very clear things. One is that, uh, you know, you have to worry about every country should have their own path, but it's not just enough. You have to worry about the sub-regions of the country, not just people employed in the coal mines, but also the whole coal ecology should be taken care of. We also knew, know that uh, uh, technologies are very important and uh, at the same time, we know that it is important to have access to technology to everyone. And uh, for that, I thought one of the important suggestions that the energy trans trans you know, transition working group was saying is that we have identified five key technologies and that this should be really attempted jointly and develop the technologies or at least I would say add, make these global public goods. So they're available to everyone in some sense. And other point I would say is that, yes, identify these technologies, push it and try to develop it together if possible, but otherwise make it public, global public goods. Second thing we have also learned is that it is not enough to look at big countries where things are taking place, but also large part of other countries. For example, we know that most of the countries in Africa do not get any finance. 
that uh, small island countries have a very different problem and that all these need to be handled together and G20 can really take some part. The third point, I think the finance, everybody said is extremely critical, uh, but finance, uh, how do you really make this finance? The developed countries who said they'll give you $100 billion a year have not even uh, lived up to that pledge. Now we are asking that we need not 100 billion, we need a trillion dollars every month, every year. And how do we manage it? Perhaps we could think about leveraging this money that comes from the public finance through providing to maybe multilateral banks, development banks, and say that you use this money only to cover the risk of private finance. So that way you can multiply the private finance that is available by maybe a factor of five or 10 by taking care of this. And if multilateral bank says we will cover the risk, then they'll be credible and more private finance may, may be mobilized. I also think that the private finance, the multilateral bank, the public finance contribution should some way relate, relate to the past emissions of different countries, maybe not even past, but at least from 1990 to 2023, uh, cumulated emissions that they're parked in the global commons parking space. At least we can charge $1 notional parking fee per ton of carbon dioxide. We can collect something like $700 billion a year. Much of it can be returned to the, uh, uh, given back to the country for expenditure on mitigation and adaptation. So you can say 80% will be given plowed back to the country, but at least then some 150 billion would be left to do the uh, other kind of financing. The third uh, point I would make, uh, make is that, uh, uh, you know, sustainable is not just technology, it not just resources, as was pointed out, you know, you have to take the economics into account. Life cycle analysis is critical. And that, but you should also worry about the social implication of this. Sociologically, things it is sustainable. If the, if the gap between the rich and the poor increases, there will be instability of a different kind. And therefore, everything will go with it. Other two points which are made is that in energy transition that India wants to make, India wants to make it in a way that increases self-reliance, at least energy self-reliance in many ways. We are importing 25% of coal, 50% of gas, and 85% of crude oil. So from that point of view, we need to move it to other places. The one more point that was made important and is extremely important is energy efficiency. And energy efficiency can cut down demand. Even, even I would say electricity demand can be cut down by energy efficiency to the tune of 40 to 50 percent. You know, and maybe then you could say I will put it EV and other things, it will increase electric demand, electricity demand, but it will st still be less than if you didn't have for electric efficiency. But one point I would like to make in efficiency is that buildings are consuming a lot of energy today. And uh, uh, I had looked at when we were doing the low carbon strategy for inclusive growth report in 2014, 13, 14, I had looked at the impact of this platinum rated buildings, which claim to have reduced their energy consumption by 85%. And out of that 85%, only 15 percentage point can be ascribed to what I would consider it architectural redesign of the buildings. The remaining came from HVAC equipment efficiency, from better man management and so on. So I think we could again push enormously significantly energy efficiency programs well directed into these kind of equipment like air conditioners and other things, but also incorporate some of this, one could say, artificial intelligence type of management 
so that even this efficient equipment is also used efficiently so that you can really minimize it even further. So I think these are issues which we need to flag for this. And they need to work out in kind of a, a, a presentable form to G20 group and we try to do that. I would say there's one other thing which I learned, which was quite interesting today, is that the idea of saying, don't push green hydrogen, go for low carbon hydrogen. And that's a very interesting suggestion, in, fa in, in fact, for a transition of energy transition. Because what? why is it interesting, I find it? We know that we can, you know, if we don't have green hydrogen, we need a lot of battery technology, batteries. Now batteries, lithium is not easily available. It's all concentrated in few countries and that it is really make you even more dependent on imports in some sense. So therefore, I think what we need to do is to say, do you have any other technology? Now other alternative battery technologies available, which are perhaps as good, but they're very large and heavy. So all kind of stationary use, one can use this battery technology, alternative battery technology uh, as, a, as, a, as quite easily. And economically, uh, material is available locally and so on, and there is not an issue there. But for the transport sector, EV, we need this, and particularly for heavy duty trucking, which was also pointed out that, you know, Zarkhand, it's not just coal all the minerals are also being shipped and they need the trucks for moving this. So one can think of having a low carbon hydrogen driven, fuel cell driven buses or trucks, which can be then use for the low, small, you know, intermediate things. And then whenever really good batteries are available, we can always replace this hydrogen by that batteries or green hydrogen by this, and you can have a really clean this. And this can even apply to what Dr. Viva Dhawan said about international uh, uh, shipping also as well. So I think that is, this is an important issue that one might think about it, that how we can mobilize uh, these things so that you're, you reach low carbon pathway as soon as possible, and then eventually go to your target. So keep pushing for green hydrogen development, but meanwhile, push low carbon, low carbon hydrogen in, in many ways. And I, I think I have more or less covered all the points, but uh, if there, there are missing, we will try to combine it in the final report. And uh, <coughs> I say that, you know, uh, I, this has been a very, very fruitful and useful and an interesting and engaging session all day. And I, uh, again, thank you all for coming and helping us here. Thank you. May I now request my uh, uh, colleague uh, to give a vote of thanks, please. Thank you, sir. So on behalf of Irade, the organizing host for the T20 G20 workshop on challenges and opportunities of sustainable energy transition. So I would like to take this opportunity to present the vote of thanks. Foremost, I, I must thank all our chairs, co-chairs and the panelists for the session. So in spite of their busy schedules and commitments, they took time uh, took uh, took time out of their busy schedules and provide uh, uh, some interesting and useful insights uh, related to the topic. So I would also like to thank the uh, T20 uh, T20 host team of ORF for supporting us to organize this event. In particular, my thanks uh, goes to Professor Samir Saran and uh, his team for uh, enabling us to organize this event under the T20. Uh, secretary team. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, the organizing team of Irade who have been uh, uh, worked with great dedication to make this event uh, a huge success. 
Uh, in particular, I like to thank my colleagues, Ms. Ananya Bhatia, Ms. Manju Verma, uh, Mr. Naman Mehta, Mr. B. K. Sarkar, who were instrumental to put this workshop together. So it was an effort of uh, almost three months that we were able to put this event together. And I must thank all, uh, all the research and uh, administration uh, team of IRADE who supported us in putting this together. I'll also like to thank uh, our team members, uh, Ms. Arushi Bajaj, who anchored the event, and also my colleague Anshuman Vehra for providing the support for managing the virtual participation. And nevertheless, all other colleagues who are present in this hall who supported the event today. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to profusely thank Professor Jyoti Parikh, Executive Director Irade, and Professor Kirit Parikh, Chairman Irade, who provided us all the necessary guidance and support to make this event a big success. So thank you all the participants who join us virtually as well as in person for this event. And we're looking forward to be in touch with all of you and we'll share the draft communique which emerged from this workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, the group picture. The high tea is ready. I request everybody to please have a cup of tea before leaving. Thank you so much, everyone.